How are you? Checking audio. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is the main audio feed to the live stream. Thank you.
All right, everyone, good afternoon. Welcome. This is the regularly scheduled Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees meeting. Today is Wednesday, July 22nd. It is 4.31 p.m. And I'd like to call the meeting to order. My name is Vivian Malaulu. I'm the current board president. For those of you joining us live online, welcome. And just as a reminder that Governor Gavin Newsom earlier this year in March loosened some Brown Act uh, regulations because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we are able to host this meeting remotely. At this time, Madam Secretary, would you please call roll? Virginia Baxter. Here. Vivian Malaulu. Here. Uduak Joe Intuk. Here. Doug Otto. Sunny Zia. Here. Thank you. Madam Secretary, do we have any comments on the closed session items? We do not have any comments on any area on the agenda tonight. Okay. So we are, um, and, and just for the benefit of the public, um, I would like to direct you to word, um, board docs for our agenda that we have attempted to make uh, public comments a little easier. There are two ways that you could submit public comments. You could email them to boardcomments at lbcc.edu, or you could leave a voicemail and record your comment at 562-938-4700. So now we are going into our closed session. We will be hearing two items in closed session discussing item 1.4, LBCCE AFT negotiation item. Pursuant to Government Code Section 3549.1 and 54957.6, update with the District Chief Negotiator, Jean Duran. Item 1.5, anticipated litigation. Pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9, B2, and that will be for two cases. So we're going to go to Agenda Item 1.6, recess to closed session. Thank you, everyone, and we will be back at 5.30.
Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome back. We are going to reconvene into our regular meeting. And this is the open session portion of the regularly scheduled Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees. Tonight is Wednesday, July 22nd. And uh, just as a reminder for those tuning in on the internet, on our YouTube channel, or watching this, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom did loosen some of the Brown Act restrictions back in March due to the COVID pandemic, and we are able to meet remotely. Uh, we uh, have already concluded our closed session, and now we'd like to begin our regular meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. And I've already spoken to Robert Rometta, our ASP classified president, who will lead us to our flag for this tonight. Everyone uh, stand, your hand over your heart, and start. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag of the United States, United States of America, America. And, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. All right, and Madam Secretary, if you could please take roll. Virginia Baxter. Here. Vivian Malaulu. Here. Uduak Joe Intuck. Here. Doug Otto. Here. Sunny Zia. Here. Student Trustee Jimenez. Here. Thank you. Thank you. And item 2.4, we have nothing to report on closed session items. I uh, would just like to let everyone know that I think we may have broken a record with a very short closed session. We adjourned at 4.50. So that's about all we have to report. Item 2.5, Madam Secretary, did we get any public comments on any agenda items? No, there are no comments. Okay, and also for the benefit of the public, uh, moving forward, however long we have to be remotely, that um, members of the public are able to submit their public comments with um, by email, and they can also leave voicemails on uh, phone numbers. Now, item 2.6, we have approval of the minutes of the June 24th Board of Trustee meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, I heard Trustee Otto, and I'm sorry I didn't catch who seconded. Trustee Baxter. Yeah. Trustee Baxter, any discussion on that? All right, we've got a motion and a second. And Madam Secretary, we do have the roll call vote everything. Student Trustee Jimenez. Aye. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Udvokio Intuck. Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. All right, motion carries. Item 2.7, our ASB president report. Hi, guys. So, greetings. It's nice. It's a pleasure seeing all of you. So, this is my report for today. It's a pleasure seeing all of you, and hopefully, you folks are doing well during these times. An update on my end. The Associate Student Body Cabinet were outlining goals that we hope that we can achieve by the end of the year. Good news, we have around 41 applicants that are interested in joining the Associate Student Body. Of course, we're still taking applications. If anybody is interested, please redirect them to me and give them the Associate Student Body email, asvpresident at lbcc.edu. And I'm also outlining, I'm in the process of outlining the meetings that we're going to have for the physical year 2020-2021, and it should be done by the first week of August. A little side note, currently I'm working with the summer voyage and student life is doing a great job letting our students know about the courses that are for our students. We hope that some, some summer voyage students can help them to get along with the college as we and hopefully I'll have more reading. Cesar, can everybody hear Cesar? No, it's hard to hear you, Cesar. Yes. Yeah. Cesar is a little hard to hear at the end, and I think also uh, President Malo Ulu, um, getting closer to your device might help a little bit. I think you're a little distant. Do you guys hear me now? Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. All right. 
Would you guys like me to repeat, or would you guys like me just to repeat the ending? No, definitely repeat. Go ahead and repeat. I'm sure you have a great report. <laughs> no worries. I appreciate it. So I said, greetings, Board of Trustees. It's a pleasure seeing all of you, and hopefully you folks are doing well during these hard times. An update at my end, the Associate Student Body Cabinet, we're outlining goals that we hope to achieve by the end of the year. Good news, we have around 41 applicants that are interested in joining the Associate Student Body. Of course, we're still taking applications. If anybody is interested, please redirect them to me and give them my Associate Student Body email, asbpresident at obcc.edu. I am also outlining the meetings that we're gonna have for the physical year 2020, 2021, and it should be done by the first week of August. A little side note, currently I'm working with the Summer Voyage and Student Life is doing a terrific job letting our students know of our resources and opportunities that there are for students. We hope some of our Summer Voyage students join ASB and help them succeed at Long Beach City College. Thank you for your time and hopefully I have more great news for you coming for the following year. That's great. Thank you guys. Thank you very much, Cesar. Thank you. Uh, item 2.8, our student trustee report. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so like Cesar said, he and I are committed to making this a great year. Um, even though everything is online right now and things are kind of up in the air, we are committed to hearing from and educating the students on student government and how we are the liaison between their voices and everybody that's um, on the upper levels like us here. So um, we, this coming year, I am committed to hearing the voice, the student voice ever before. I do want to create an online um, way of them communicating with us directly, those on the cabinet. So um, I'm going to be working with the advisor and um, Navon Watson to figure out how that can be done. We kind of have some ideas, but nothing is set in stone just yet. So when it is, I'll definitely be announcing that. So yeah, looking forward to hearing more of what the students have to say um, in an easier, um, more accessible way. So that should be interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenna. And now we're gonna move on to item 2.9, LBCCSA Bargaining President Report. Hello, everybody. Um, as we're quickly approaching the new academic year, um, the FA has elected some new members to our executive board. Uh, the board consists of 14 members, and we have through three members that were newly elected and will begin have begun their term July 1st. So I just like to acknowledge them. First, we have Dr. Jerome Hunt, who will be speaking later today, who has been elected as our equity rep. He's from the History and Political Science Department, and he is replacing Suman Mundaneri. We have Dr. Rob, Rodney Rodriguez, who is the PCC rep. He's from the English department, and he will be, be replacing Maureen Mason. And then we have Michael Hubbard, who will be our new membership chair, and he is from the counseling department. And we have elected a new membership chair because our membership person um, has run and was elected uh, for our new VP, and that's Dr. Crispin, Vanessa Crispin Peralta. Kristen, uh, Vanessa is starting her fifth year. She's newly tenured, and she's from the History and Political Science Department. Um, I am going to introduce her. She has a bachelor's degree from Chico State in history, and she has her master's and PhD from UC San Diego in early American history and so Vanessa, I believe, is on here, and I would like to introduce our new FA um, Vice President to all of you. Vanessa? Hi, everybody. Thank you, Diana, for that kind introduction. Just a quick uh, clarification. It's UC uh, Santa Barbara, not San Diego. So, you know, got to stand up for my gout. I, I, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Speaking too quickly. Um, yeah, it happens. So, um, 
you know, thanks so much for just giving me the opportunity to say hi to you all. Uh, if you were hanging out a little bit earlier, you heard me chatting with um, Trusty Baxter. I teach uh, the women's history course that uh, she pioneered for us. And I'm so grateful to be able to do that. It's such a fun course. And then I teach our early American history classes as well. And um, I've been working with FA for a couple of years now, and I'm excited to start in this new role as VP, and I'll be getting to know some of you a little bit more, and some of you I already know, but, um, you know, I just wanted to take an opportunity to um, extend my gratitude to all of you for helping in this really difficult transition as we've moved into remote learning. I'm one of those people who had never taught online before, so it was definitely a very steep learning curve, Um, and I have to say that, you know, with the hard work of FA and with the help of the administration and all the people here, you know, you made that process as easy as it could be. And um, I greatly appreciate that. So thanks for giving me a a moment to say hi. And uh, I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you both. Now we will move on to item 2.10, AFC Marketing President Report. Hi. Good evening, Board President Malalulu, Interim President uh, Luann Bynum, and esteemed board members. I know you're aware that we reached a tentative agreement, but I wanted to report that our memberships are totally behind this agreement. And also, we had elections last month, and we had two, we we did that virtually, and we have two new e-board members as well. I wanted to announce that we have Nikki Frederick as a PCC rep, and Aretha Brooks is our uh, PCC grievance officer now. And uh, I want everybody to know if they have any questions to please ask them for their uh, related areas. Also tonight, I want to recognize all the hard work classifieds done during the semester, whether it was supporting the students from home or working on the campus. Without all of you, the classified, the college could not have been as successful as we has been with our past students this semester. Thank you and good night. Thank you very much. Do we have um, anyone here for item 2.11, the certificated hourly instructor bargaining president report? Yes, Curtis Williams. Hi, Curtis, welcome. Thanks, Vivian. Uh, board, uh, board members, uh, trustees, uh, vice presidents, students, staff, and faculty, I'm the newly elected CHI president. I just wanted to say thank you I'm looking forward to working with uh, all the all the people on campus so that we get the best possible uh, um, teaching and learning experience. I've been at Long Beach City College teaching. I started in 96, but I, I graduated from, from Long Beach City in 1982. And uh, so I've been here for a, a little while. And my, my mom is a retired professor in foods and nutrition. Uh, I see Jenny nodding her head. Yes, she knows Carolyn Williams. And I saw her today. She's enjoying retirement. All right. Uh, Thanks again. Welcome, uh, Curtis. It's been a long time. Um, I was actually talking about you the other day and the mangoes that you grow. I don't know if your ears were ringing. I I ate all the mangoes that I grew this year. (laughs) All right. Thank you. Okay, item 2.12, would any board member like to reorder the agenda? All right, so let's move on to item 3.1, the superintendent-president report. Thank you very much, President Malaulu and uh, board members. I hope everybody's enjoying the summer, although I expect, like uh, me, it's just all kind of run in from one season to another, but at least we have some nice weather. This is day 128 since we have closed the, both campuses because of the pandemic. And traditionally at this time of year, it slows down a little bit. People get to take a breather, um, take some vacations. But I have to say, everybody continues to work so very hard getting training on Canvas and working on innovative ways to put student services um, modalities up for our students and preparing for the fall. And um, we are uh, going to be online in the fall. Speaking of the fall, I think everybody has heard that. Um, We will have essential labs on uh, both campuses 
Um, sometimes people get a little confused about what we mean by essential, but essential is defined by the state government and the um, uh, COVID-19 in Long Beach. And it has to do with those classes that help us maintain essential workers in health, food preparation, some of the trades areas, those kinds of things. But everybody has worked so hard to put extensive details and plans in place and have customized those details and plans for the different labs that we have. So I just want to thank everyone for the amazing work they've done to do that. It's not, it's not easy. It can be very complex. And um, we're continuing to look at ways that we can streamline things. We learned a lot in the past semester, and we're going to apply our best practices from the spring into the fall. Um, I just would like to say also that communications has sent out a really lovely brochure to about 300, about 230 households, um, encouraging people that are out of work to come back and listing some classes that might be available for them that are useful. So we're hoping to see some of those folks that need some help in our community get a little up skills and training and maybe some retraining. We have also made the decision that winter is going to be online. Um, we'll have to make several changes to the um, calendar and we haven't, we're not quite ready to announce that yet, but as soon as we have that information, we'll put that out. And of course, everybody's asking about spring semester. Um, I'm sure you're all wondering, we'd all love to be back in campus. I was there the other day had the opportunity, I was doing some taping, had the opportunity to see one of our classes back using protective equipment. It was our medical assisting class. And I have to say, I just really missed the campus and the students because it's a totally different thing. But um, we're making decisions based, of course, on health and safety. And we won't know until probably later on in the fall what that's gonna look like in the spring. So we're going to be prepared for anything um, hopefully, we'll be able to come back more, but um, we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. Of, you know, safety is our number one priority for our students and then making sure that they can get through. Um, last week, we received wonderful news that the Trump administration rescinded the policy that it would have forced international students to go home if they um, weren't taking any face-to-face -face classes. We're very thrilled to hear that that's the case. We have um, a number, we have about 80 right now international students at Long Beach City College. We want them to be here. We want them to continue their education. We're going to continue to communicate with them and um, surely hope that this doesn't change. Athletics, um, that's been a big question this summer. What are we going to do with athletics? You've probably heard that the Athletic um, Commission, C C2, 2A, I think is, C3, 2A, I think is what it's called made a decision to flip the semesters essentially with competition in the spring in two segments and um, conditioning and other courses in the fall. Um, they've reduced the competition by about 25% because of the compressed timeline. So um, all of the competition will take place in the spring and we're just gonna keep our fingers crossed that we can continue to have that competition. Um, I wanted to also report on our framework for reconciliation. You passed, our board passed that resolution last month, and we held a meeting with the um, leadership at CCEJ and received a proposal from them to come in and help the college, help us establish a framework and a dialogue with our, amongst ourselves and with our students and with the community about what we can do to be um, better at how we welcome and integrate um, our students of color, especially black and brown students, into what we're doing. You'll be hearing tonight from um, our faculty who've done a wonderful job in this cultural curriculum uh, work that they've been doing. And this is so important because it's a real, it's, it's a very significant piece of work on pedagogy that helps us to take a look at curriculum. And I'm happy to say that we've got about 130 faculty that are involved in that right now. But we did get a proposal from CCEJ. Um, I sent that to trustees uh, Baxter and trustee Intook uh, yesterday for them to take a look at it. And hopefully they'll agree that it's a, a good way to proceed and, and we'll be able to um, start that fairly soon. Um, I also wanted to let you know this uh, superintendent um, search process. We have completed a, a good draft, I think at this point, 
of the, uh, the um, proposals for search firms to come in. And it needs some more work. We'll be taking a look at that. And as soon as we finalize that to the best um, possible place, then we'll put out a notice and expect to have somebody um, perhaps um, in the fall, at the beginning of the fall, to come on and work with the board and the college in this area. Also, I, we have wonderful news about one of our classified staff. I'm going to turn it over real quickly, if you don't mind, to Vice President Duran to make the announcement because I think the, the nomination came from that area. So if you wouldn't mind, Jean. Jean, you're on, you're on a... How's that better? Perfect. Thank you. So as you recall, it was March I had the privilege of presenting to the board uh, the district's nomination for a classified employee of the year for the board's endorsement. And the name we put forward was Aaron Turner. Aaron is a custodian uh, with the district who has always exemplified a high level of service along with all of his colleagues. And currently actually he is working at a class as a custodial supervisor, assisting his colleagues in the, and uh, the district uh, with some of their work, especially as we respond to some of the facility needs that we have been asked to do. So yesterday we received a notice and announcement from the California a community College Board of Governors, that they have um, awarded six individuals from across the, the um, community colleges to have the honor. Aaron Turner is one of them. So we are quite grateful for that. Uh, he is he's an excellent example of our facilities team who every day work really hard behind the scenes. It's a reason we have such exceptionally beautiful facilities, uh, buildings, um, and everything that works. So I just want to thank Aaron and congratulate him. I'm very grateful to call him one of my colleagues, and I'm very grateful to have the entire facilities team supporting him and Aaron being an example of that great and exceptional hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Yes, um, they've been doing an amazing job, not only the regular work they do, but the deep cleaning and sanitizing that's been going on. And I had the pleasure of meeting Aaron before I had to kick myself out of my office and was so impressed by his presence and his poise and the work that he was doing. So we're proud to call him our own. Um, we're providing a lot of support to the community still. Just to give you a few statistics, I think you're gonna be kind of surprised. The drive through testing location at Beth Stadium has accommodated about 12,700 people since they started testing on May 1st. And the Rapid Assessment Clinic at PCC has accommodated 25,700 people since the site opened on April 6th. That's really amazing. I think we've got close to 35% of the city um, being tested at both of our sites. And as always, we're very proud as a college to be able to help our community and our city in that regard. We also, last Friday, I know that uh, President Malauulu and um, a few other people uh, participated. The Pacific Coast Campus was the site of a food distribution event that was sponsored by the LA County Board of Supervisors, Janice Hahn, um, LA Regional Food Bank, the City of Long Beach, LA, LA County Federation of Labor. I understand that 3,000 families came and got two boxes of groceries and they also distributed 2,000 diapers. I also understand that cars were lined up from the Pacific Coast campus to the traffic circle in Long Beach. Now that's a distance of about two miles down Pacific Coast Highway. So needless to say, there's a lot of need in our community and I was happy and we're all happy that we can continue to help support that as well. There's a couple of things going on with legislative advocacy. Um, the stimulus package that uh, the Congress is working on, we sent letters to our senators um, Feinstein and um, Harris to let them know that we're very supportive of the package that also supports our community colleges. We talked about the budget issues. We want them to know that Long Beach City College is an engine, an economic engine, and it is a place for people to recover from this and be able to get some economic upgrades as well. So we're keeping our eyes closely on that. I mentioned last month that the Maritime Training uh, Career Grants um, was um, being looked at in Congress. The House passed that yesterday. We're very happy to say that. The Port of Long Beach um, and the city also um, signed on to that. But 
it's actually part of the National Defense Authorization Act, and it's going to the Senate. And if it does pass, we've got an opportunity to be able to um, apply for some funding for our Maritime Center, which would be really wonderful. And I, I'm sure everybody's heard about the cannabis program. Um, it was a big deal in the news the last week or so. Um, the program that we have is an eight-week class. It's being offered through workforce development. It is a not for credit class. Um, it's going to focus on the cannabis industry. And the content is going to include cultivation. We are not growing anything at Long Beach City College. Um, retail, cannabis and California history, and tracking and tracing the cannabis system in California from plants to consumers. I just heard that this is pretty astounding. We've got classes that can accommodate probably 35 to 40. I just heard that we have 537 people on a wait list to get into that class. So we're going to have to figure out how we're going to handle that. That's a good problem to have, I think. Um, I want to thank the Long Beach Collective Association who's collaborated in this course design for us, and they're going to be helping us to teach the course. Also, we are receiving personnel um, protective equipment from the Chancellor's Office in partnership with the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. All community colleges are getting this equipment at no cost. Some of the items that we'll be receiving are N95 and cloth and surgical masks, uh, face shields, infrared thermometers, and hand sanitizers. So I think that's uh, due to come in the next couple of three weeks, and we'll be distributing that on campus as needed. Um, college Day, we're planning for College Day. Everybody, please mark your calendars for August 28th. We're going to have a pretty exciting day. It'll be a virtual event like our virtual commencement was. Um, unfortunately, we can't come together, which is always a disappointment, but we're going to try to make this as fun as we possibly can and as interesting as we possibly can. We've got some news to come on that. Um, you had a chance, I hope, to look at the recent campus community news. One thing I wanted to mention in that was that the Long Beach Rotary did give us a $10,000 scholarship for students for basic needs. And so we're very grateful for that. And then our performing arts department um, put together 100 masks to distribute to our essential workers here at the campus. So we really appreciate them going the extra mile to do that. And I want to congratulate, I know it's a tentative agreement at this point, it will be on the board agenda item tonight, but AFT and the Human Resources Department and those people who participated in the negotiating teams. For AFT, it's Robert Rometta, Mark Smith, Kathy Atwood, Elizabeth Gallardo, and for the district, Jean Duran, Jennifer Ramos, and Susan Salazar. And I want to acknowledge the board also for the work that they've done, not only on the one for AFT, but as well for um, FA. And finally, I have some good congratulatory news to share with you. Um, uh, just last week, I think, um, Supervisor Janice Hahn, LA, Los Angeles County Supervisor Janice Hahn, appointed our own trustee, Sunny Zia, to the Los Angeles County Probation Commission. And that's a pretty big deal, I think. The commission is charged with oversight of the administration of juvenile delinquency laws in LA County, helping to promote the health, education, and success of youth involved in the juvenile um, justice system while ensuring their humane and effective treatment and providing a level of advisory oversight regarding the impact of its operations and uh, also on what they have in adult probationary probationers. The commission also interfaces with the county probation department, the community, and the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. The Board of Supervisors has approved the creation of this first ever probation oversight commission, and this new commission is going to replace the former probation commission, and that will sunset. So I want to um, congratulate Trustee Sunny Zia. We appreciate your efforts and um, also working and making us look good in the community. And that says a lot, I think, for the college and its leadership. And with that, um, I will end my report and turn it over to President Malaulu. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent President Lan Bynum. You've done an amazing job. And I appreciate all the good news that you have to report. I know it makes uh, everyone feel so much better, even though can't be together, we are still connected, and everyone is able to, to get the update and see what we're all doing, so I appreciate that. Um, moving on to item 4.1, we have
have the cultural curriculum audit, and I will defer that to Dr. Kathy Scott, who will make an introduction, and this will be our only presentation for the evening. Thank you, President Malaulu. Good evening, members of the board, inter uh, interim superintendent, President Bynum, students, faculty, staff, and members of the public. I'm here with two of my outstanding faculty colleagues, Dr. Winnie, Wendy Kennig, our curriculum chair, and Dr. Jerome Hunt, political science faculty member. We very much appreciate the opportunity to present the work we have done over the last year and a half on our cultural curriculum audit. Um, Dr. Kenning has been a leader from the beginning, and Dr. Hunt was a superstar auditor, and I got to see what, what he had done when Dr. Kenning had him present his work at the curriculum committee. Um, the idea for this audit came about from an April 2018 Academic Senate Flex Day Equity event, and the speaker at that time, Dr. Terrell Strayhorn. He challenged us with a number of questions, one of them being, have you ever done a cultural audit of your curriculum? And we thought to ourselves, no, we haven't. Afterwards, a group of us in academic affairs, administrators and faculty met to discuss it. This group included Dr. Kennig, Dr. Matt Lawrence, who made a significant contribution to this work, uh, Dr. Colin Williams, Dr. Ama Bashawa, Michelle Grimes Hillman and Kenna Hillman. These various individuals represented curriculum, the academic senate, equity, or guided pathways. And it's very important to us that our audit be seen, as was the case from the beginning, as a collaborative effort. And why did we need one? Our group knew that we have not been meeting the needs of many of our Black, Latinx, and, and Pacific Islander students in the way that we should be. When shockingly large numbers of students of color and a majority of our classes are not, who are not completing or not passing, it is a crisis. We know that we change students' lives, but we also know that many of our students, and particularly our students of color, leave our institution feeling less than or unsupported or in some cases hopeless in regards to their education. We cannot continue to look at the numbers we see and not realize that these numbers are also students' lives and dreams. What makes this effort particularly important for our faculty and our institution is that it's practical. It provides strategies for faculty to use to modify or enhance their courses. And the data is clear as to why we need it. Next, next slide, please. There is no question that we have done excellent work at the institution in some areas. Program completions over the last three years have been impressive, and we moved from being one of the lowest performing colleges in the state to, in this regard to being the second most improved in the state. These successes came about from curriculum created and revised by faculty and from collaborations between academic affairs and student services, such as the very impressive work on AB 705 by math, English, and student services. But much of it came through student services itself hiring completion counselors, case managing students with 45 to 60 units, pr prioritizing disproportionately impacted student groups, and streamlining graduation petition processes. Dr. Munoz and his team are to be commended for this work. Next slide, please. The associate degrees for transfer have been particularly impressive with a 29% increase in associate degrees for transfer for overall. Um, 29%, I'm sorry. And then that, that, that included a 23% increase in ADT for Hispanic students, 48% for African American students, and 53% for Asian and Pacific Islander students. Next slide, please. But these increases cannot be sustained if we don't make a difference in the core success rate. In 2018, we were ranked 113 out of 114 colleges in our system for course success. We are seven points below the state average of 72%. And uh, we have, a, as you can see here, a 65% course, course success rate, which is a C or better or pass in a class. And, and of, course, of course, includes in completion. Um, Knowing that 82% of our students are students of color, we know that we have major equity gaps. And the, these rankings and these statistics are clearly unacceptable. Next slide, please. This slide shows a four-year average in course success disaggregated by ethnicity as a comparison to white student. 
white students. As you can see, we have a 9% gap for Latinx students in course success, a 12% gap for Pacific Islanders, and a 19% gap for African American students. None of these is acceptable, and we have to own them, although we also recognize that we have the ability to change them. The cultural curriculum audit was designed to provide the personal equity data, the reflection, the understanding, and the practical training faculty need to make these changes. And those who have gone through it have done some really amazing work. At this point, I will turn it over to Dr. Kennick to explain our audit in more detail. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Next slide, please. So when we recognized that we needed to do this curriculum audit, uh, sooner rather than later. Um, one of the important aspects was to provide faculty with the information that they needed, and in many cases, a wake-up call. So this is a, a sample of the, um, the individualized course success um, profile that we provided to all the faculty who were involved in, in the audit so far. This was given to them privately. Uh, it's important when you're having these kinds of uh, sort of difficult conversations and realizations that people feel comfortable, they, but they also need to recognize where things stand. So this was an important step to get people to look at their data. They didn't have to share it, but they did definitely use it as they worked through the audit activities. So uh, next slide, please. So the format of the audit to this point, uh, we've had two in-person audits where you had three days of intensive workshopping, and then we also had a 100-plus page workbook with assignments and readings for people to do uh, outside of class, so to speak. Um, and to our credit, before we even went online with the pandemic, we had already planned to do a, a cultural curriculum audit that was dedicated to online teaching. So we were well underway to, to getting that started, and it's actually taking place right now. So next slide, please. So I also wanted to address um, a lot of times when you're talking about equity gaps and, and culturally relevant uh, or responsive curriculum, people will say, well, that's fine in the humanities, but how do I do it in my course? And I just wanted to show you that we've had a tremendous amount of sort of disciplines involved in this so far. This is just a sampling of the first two audits, and then we have one going on right now that expands this even further. So uh, no excuses from anybody outside of the humanities to say they can't do this. Next slide, please. So this is um, the announcement that we had for the summer 2020 online uh, cultural audit that's going on. Uh, and I'm going to recognize the folks who are leading this in just a minute. So next slide, please. Uh, just to give you a sample, a little taste of what's going on, um, for the online, they're also having weekly meetings, but it's a three-week uh, session rather than the three intensive days, which gives people a little bit of a break from a Zoom meeting. You don't want a six-hour Zoom meeting. That's never a good idea. So um, so this is a sample of what's going on presently, uh, and this is being led by Michael Robertson, our online faculty coordinator, and Nancy Mahan from the math department. Next slide, please. So I'm going to hand it over to one of our superstars, Dr. Jerome Hunt uh, from Political Science. He was a uh, participant in our first audit, and he made tremendous strides in his own class, and he's been always willing to share his experience. So take it away, Dr. Hunt. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about what we actually did um, in the curriculum audit. And we started out by really looking at our courses through thinking about equity and through an equity lens. And thankful to Dr. Matt Lawrence, he came up with these eight equity precepts that we talked about. And we did a number of activities, including talking about collaborative norm settings, uh, looking at implicit bias. We also looked at cultural representation within our syllabuses um, and images that we use in the class classroom for various materials in PowerPoint. Uh, we talked about preferred pronouns and also combating a deficit mindset. Uh, next slide, please. We also focused on four domains of teaching. So we really looked at the course content and also the course outline of record if it needed to be adjusted. It was, we were given the ability to talk to Wendy and figure out what we would need to do if we needed to change any of the course outline. Um, we also talked about classroom experience. We had a lot of discussion about assignments and assessments uh, in terms of really thinking about how could we really equity-minded create assignments and assessments that would be beneficial to all of our students. And we also talked about grading and feedback as well. Next slide, please. So I partnered with um, an adjunct faculty member um, from my department, and what we ended up doing is had a large conversation about how students were not necessarily represented in the material that individuals were presenting in classes. And I shared a book that I'm using that you see here, uh, which is called American Government in Black and White. And through this discussion, um, we had our adjunct instructor really um, look into adapting this or a similar book uh, for his class. And we really came to the conclusion 
not only with in the political science department, but also with individuals that we were at the table with, that this is really actually necessary. And one of the things that we don't talk a lot about, we have a lot of academic freedom. We don't ever really talk about making sure that we select materials that really actually reflect uh, the student population. So this is one of the discussions that we had there. Next slide, please. So another thing we talked about was a classroom experience. So we talked about things like how can we improve our active learning strategies? We talked a lot about like, what would your teaching style look like? Uh, can it develop over time? Are you doing it the same way that you've always been doing it? Do you need a refresher? Um, we also looked at things about how to make the classroom more inclusive. And that inclusivity was really focused on not only reflecting the students, but also reflecting you as an instructor within the class. And personally, I never really thought about reflecting my myself in the class. I always thought about how can I really, you know, reflect my students, but I never thought about like, what do I have to offer into the class and what does that really actually add to the class? So we had a lot of discussions about that. We also talked about improving group project cohesiveness because we all know that everybody hates to really do a group project, but it's one of those things that we have to do. Um, and we also talked about reaching beyond the classroom walls, knowing that we only have a short amount of time within, you know, a couple times a week or one time a week if you teach a one day a week class to really reach out to students and we tried to figure out strategies that we could use to reach them outside of the classroom walls, whether it would be to send text messages to students, um, whether it's to tell telephone calls or emails or just simply open up your office. And that brings me to the next slide, please. So I adapted this uh, student hours coupon from Dr. Matt Lawrence. Um, so I can't take the credit for it, but it's a wonderful idea. And I encourage all individuals that are teaching our student population to, to seriously consider this. It's a very simple way to really connect with students outside of the classroom walls. So what I've done is just offer two points of extra credit for simply just coming to the office. You can talk about nothing. You can just come for food because I normally have food and drinks in my office. Or you can talk about an, an assignment. You could talk about what you want to do with your career, um, or you could just be talking about the local sports team. It doesn't really necessarily matter. Um, and I found that this has really helped students, one, understand what students hours are for, and also breaks down that barrier that we have between students and ourselves. Because a lot of students feel that they can't come to you during the times that you're in your office because if like you're doing some massive busy work that like, I don't know, you're solving uh, finding a cure for cancer uh, and that you can't be disturbed when you know, we're really there for them. And this really helps them to understand that this is what we are there for. Next slide, please. So the next thing I want to talk about are assignments and assessments. So we had a lot of talk about how do we really change and transform what our assignments look like. And that really starts with us thinking about what the syllabus looks like. Is it welcoming? Do students get what they really need to get out of the syllabus? We also talked about transparency, um, not only in our teaching, but also in terms of the assignments and how we provided the students with assignments. Um, and we also talked about things like maybe making your assignments in a sequential order to really work your students up to the project that you would like them to really actually see. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, before we talk about the assignments a, a little bit more, I want to show you what my uh, syllabus looked like prior to going through uh, the cultural curriculum audit. And as you can see here, it's just full of text with maybe one or two images there. I had came from a previous uh, institution where they were really strict about making sure you had all the rules and procedures and everything uh, put on the syllabus. So that was what I was bringing with myself to LBCC. Um, but after going through the curriculum audit, I realized that I can make some very simple, drastic changes changes that really actually improve my class. And as you can see from the next slide, please. This is what my syllabus looked like after the curriculum audit. I still kept a lot of the information that was there. I just reformatted it. Very simple. It only took me a couple hours to do. Nothing um, out of the ordinary of what I would do preparing for any other semester. Um, but I made it a little bit more engaging for the students. I, I tried to break up information, give them all the things they needed to know first and foremost, like what is the text? Here's a picture of myself because I know that um, for myself being a younger faculty member, I always get mistaken for being a student in the class. And when I stand in front of the room, they're like, oh, wait a minute, you're the instructor. So that kind of breaks that little barrier down there by providing that information. Um, I've also started providing students with my social media um, handle as a way to, for them to connect with me outside of the classroom. So really breaking down those walls there. Um, you can see there that I've been like keys to success. I've created things of like letting know it's a safe environment in the classroom and outlining some ground rules, but then also allowing them to create their own rules um, as well. 
So I know you may be thinking, well, this is political science. This is, you know, pretty easy for you to do. You can, you know, talk about numerous things and related to students. So if you could go to the next slide, please. We'll see here is a, a syllabus from an anatomy class. And this is what it looked like prior to the curriculum audit. And the next slide, please, will show you what it looked like afterwards. So you can see it doesn't matter what your discipline is. It's very simple to make some changes to really make your syllabus actually engaging for the students. And what I always tell my colleagues is to think about it this way. When you were sitting in the classroom, what things did you like and what things did you did not like? Um, and those are the things that you bring in and think about when you're going through and revising your syllabus and assignments. Next slide, please. So to piggyback to the assignments, um, here is an assignment that I have revised as a result of the curriculum audit using Mary Ann Wickland's uh, transparent assignment template. And the whole pur purpose of this template is to give purpose, let the students know what skills they're going to develop there, what knowledge they should get out of it, give them tasks that they need to do, and give them criteria for success. So I let the students first and foremost know that all my writing assignments are done to improve their critical thinking and writing skills. Um, I allow them to know that they're going to use this as a way to put and take the information from the class and apply it in a practical manner. I also always make sure that I give them the minimum requirements of what is needed, um, and then I also give them the criteria of what I'm looking for. So I will give them, for this case of the opinion piece, reputable sites of opinion pieces that I'll put on the course website the very first day of the semester. And I also encourage the students to hyperlink to their sources. Um, and I also give them a video and show them exactly how to do that. And then I finally remind them that if they have any questions, to so let me know. I'm always here to help them if they do need help. And in addition to just this information I provide on the syllabus, I also provide them with a course rubric from day one in the class. So that way they can see exactly what are the requirements? What do I need to do? And they can start thinking about how can I start crafting this assignment? Do I need to go to the writing center uh, for help? They can start thinking about those things very early in the semester, and that leads to their ultimate success in the class. Next slide, please. So the last thing I want to talk about before I turn it back over uh, to Dr. Koenig is that we talked about grading and feedback and thinking about how can we make our classes more equitable in terms of grading. And we had a large discussion about blind grading. And I had never done blind grading prior to this and didn't even know it was possible via Canvas, um, but it is possible. So it takes two seconds to really actually do it. And what it simply does is that it takes the names off of all the assignments. It's only a student number. You can just look at the assignment and really grade the assignment for the content and don't get bogged down by bringing your own biases and things that you feel about um, a student into that actual assignment. I've been guilty of it myself. Uh, as an instructor, you'll sit there and see a person saying like, oh, they're just probably having a bad day. They usually do really well in the class. I'll give them a, I'll slide a couple extra points to them this time. You know, it'll be okay. And then for other students, who are not necessarily engaging, you try to look at them a little bit harder. And I realized that wasn't fair to the students. Like I had to give them the same uh, credit and help all across the board, no matter who they were. So this blind grading was a great idea. And it's really, I think, helped me and helped the students get a lot more in terms of feedback. And then we also finally talked about this wise feedback model about, you know, it's, it's okay, because we always know about this compliment sandwich. And, you know, that's a little bit overdone. But we have to think about what is the purpose of feedback? What do we really want the students to get out of it? And if we do give them feedback, what are they going to do with that feedback? And you have to really think about all of those things when you start to craft assignments, because you want the students not only to just complete the assignment, but you also want them to be able to grow and actually do better and take those skills into future classes with them. So that's my part of the presentation. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Koenig. Thank you very much, Dr. Hunt. Next slide, please. So one of the important components of our audit is that we do actually require deliverables because as we all know, you can go to a conference, uh, you have wonderful ideas, wonderful discussions, and you have the best of intentions, and then you just never get around to doing anything with it. So we, uh, we've we asked our participants to prepare all of these items. And one of the most important one is the highlights PowerPoint, because this allows us to call upon people and say, hey, share your ideas, share your experience. And, and Dr. Hunt did that at Curriculum. We've had, um, we've also been, presenting this uh, at the Curriculum Institute, the statewide uh, meeting. Uh, we've had some requests to uh, explain the cultural audit to Cerritos College, to Pasadena, to the San Diego Community College District. People are really interested in this because they want to know how to do it and they want to get their faculty on board. So these are, these are the things that were required at the end of the experience. 
So next slide, please. So I do want to, um, everybody wants to know, okay, what are the results? Where's the data? Now, I just, the, you know, with the caveat of it takes a little bit of time for these things to really have an impact. But the good news is, is that they did, uh, IE has helped us uh, look into the data for the summer cohort, the original group that went through. And it turns out that even though the overall success rate for the college went down a little bit, that particular cohort uh, was able to raise its success rates in their courses 3.3%, uh, which is, it's, you know, it's, it's not a huge number, but it's, it's an improvement. And we're very happy and grateful for that. And I think we can continue to improve with that, especially because um, our participants are turning into our new leaders. So this is not just the same group of people doing it again and again. And so if you show me the next slide, please. I just want to point out that, um, you know, what can we do now? What do we do with this great activity? So the first thing is um, we have uh, Michael Robertson and Nancy Mahan, who were both uh, participants in the audit. They are leading the online cultural audit that's going on right now. Uh, we're going to publicize the work and continue to do that um, and reach out to other colleges and share this. And so the other project that's on the horizon for us is to work with um, faculty professional development, Suman Mundanori and others, to turn the audit into something that we can offer sort of all year long. Because right now it's only been offered in summer and winter intercessions so that people have time to do it. But we really need to do this constantly. We need to get everybody on board. And we always, almost always have a waiting list for these. More We can't you know, handle enough. Uh, there's so much request for this. So I'm really excited. Uh, thank you for letting us present. Um, we're very proud of our work. And I think this is going to bring uh, a lot of glory to Long Beach City. So thank you. Thank you very much. I, I don't know if Dr. Scott would like to add to that uh, presentation and as a conclusion. I, I would just say that I too am very proud of the work that the faculty have done. Um, Dr. Kenick has been a great leader here and Dr. Hunt has presented, I've, this is my third time hearing him present and he actually gets better each time. So, um, and it really did make a big impact when we presented at the Statewide Curriculum Institute, it was about two weeks ago. So um, we're, we're hearing from a lot of people and we're really excited to be seen as a leader in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the information that Dr. Koenig and Dr. Hunt shared with us. I don't know if any of the other board members would like to weigh in. I'm sorry, I can't see anyone's reaction. I definitely do, President uh, Malaulu. Trustee, student trustee. Um, she's on mute, so I'll just go ahead. I really want to thank you guys for um, participating in this audit. I, I do think it was truly successful. Um, I love the way that the formatting is. And as a student, I, I really appreciate that, you know, the faculty is setting us up for success in their classrooms and being, you know, honest and transparent with how they can come in as their best selves. So I really appreciate that as a student and I know many other students are gonna benefit from this um, audit. So definitely um, we should continue this into the future. And I'm glad that we're you know, letting other colleges know about this as well, because I do think that having more inclusive structures are, um, are helpful to students. So thank you. Thank you, that's great feedback. We appreciate that, thank you. President Malulu, since I'm off mute, may I speak? Trustee Baxter. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Yes, go right ahead. I, I'm okay. uh, I'm trying to attempt to, to connect with a different audio, but yes, thank you, Jenna. I did hear you and acknowledge you, and, and thank you, uh, Trustee Baxter. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, as a as a former faculty member, I am very, very impressed by what you're doing. Uh, I wish there had been something like this. Uh, a lot of the things I did, but a lot of the things I could have done and should have done. Um, and uh, I think this is a real step in the right direction. And uh, I applaud you very much. Wendy and uh, and Dr. Hunt, who I don't know, but I hope to get to know you soon, and uh, and the work that you're doing. Thank you, Trustee Baxter. Hey, Trustee uh, Intech here. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Trustee Intech. Hey, I just want to uh, thank Wendy and Jerome for the presentation and. Um, the, you know, the effort, all the efforts that the, you know, I know there's a collaborative effort from faculty and, um, you know, management folks and uh, administrators, uh, you know, the efforts we've done on 
starting to do an unbiased syllabi, you know, even before this, that we continue to build on these, these uh, academic best practices to really serve the needs of the students today is really wonderful. Um, you know, I, I have, you know, been a faculty member and uh, have dealt with the generation gap the culture gap, the social media gap, you know, uh, walking around the classroom, I've caught students watching soccer games on their phones in the middle of class. Like, Hey, how are you going to learn thermodynamics watching soccer? You know? So, uh, but you know, that's, that's the wired generation that we have today. Um, but I, you know, looking at the example Jerome had on there, I used to make my syllabus look like that. You know, here's the rules, here's the hours. Don't be late. You know, uh, very rigid, you know, not welcoming, you know, not, no color graphics, no social media. So just the example that he put on there that, you know, I, I have a 21 year old, I, you know, getting her to email somebody is really difficult and have that little snapshot of like, hi, I'm so-and-so in your poli sci 100 class. Like, can I talk to you? Like, what is the point of, you know, office hours with a coupon? It may seem very basic, but I think it's, it's the multi levels of communication to get through to the, you know, because this is, you have cycles of students that come in this semester, or it's going to be totally different next semester and the semester after that and winter session. And so having something that, and then, you know, continuously improve, you know, asking students, is there anything else that I was missing or you would like to have on there? And maybe something they put in their end of the semester evaluations or, you know, just, or maybe there's a new platform that comes out that Snapchat's not cool anymore and you got to get a new handle, you know. <laughs> But it's, uh, it's really great uh, to see the work we're doing. Um, I did get a lot of kudos from our meeting last month when we had folks talk about their dissertations and doctorate work, which was focused on Long Beach City College and our students and things that could be adapted. And that this is now on our website, you know, on the board doc. So, you know, as you're thinking of sharing this uh, across other organizations, you can just send them a link to the PDF and the board docs. Oh, here it is on our board. We present it to the board and here's the link to, to the PDF. So it makes it real easy that as we're adapting to the COVID era, you know, that uh, we can make, make this information available. A couple of things I, I wanted to ask about, um, what was your thoughts on intersectionality? You know, a lot of times we think about students in a, a, a monolingual or mono, you're either like Latinx or you're African-American, but many times we're all of those plus. And I didn't know how that came across in the cultural audit of the intersectionality. And I don't know if Wendy or Jerome can speak to that. Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll start. I think Dr. Hunt will probably chime in as well. Um, I think that's a conversation that we need to improve on, actually, because um, one of the things that we started with the audit was to sort of see where people were in terms of understanding equity at all, you know, and getting to the really basic level of recognizing the gaps, recognizing the issues. I think the intersectionality is going to be crucial because some of the things some of the things we can improve on, some of the things are going to be up to society in general. I mean, we're talking, you know, if we don't have internet connectivity as a public utility, if we don't have everybody with a laptop, it's going to be very difficult for us to, to help people in a genuine way. We can do only so much. We're doing everything we can on our end. Um, but that's something that I think we need to bring up more. And I think we'll be able to do that now that we have so many people who are fluent with the basic conversation about equity. Now let's get into the nuance of it and how to, and not to think of people as a monolithic block. No, there are different experiences, no matter what your ethnic background. So I, I appreciate your comments. So Dr. Hunt, I don't know if you want to... I can uh, definitely chime in. I would say that I think that even though there wasn't a component about intersectionality within the actual training, I think the beauty of the training is that there's so many people from cross disciplines and different backgrounds that ultimately we ended up having conversations about intersectionality. And we found that you really couldn't talk about one thing without really bringing intersectionality into it. So, um, you know, I was part of the first cohort, so I'm pretty sure that, you know, things are steadily improving uh, with each cohort, but I really do see the the potential to actually have those intersectional conversations be more formalized, because I'm pretty sure they're already happening informally right now. Great. Thank you both. Really appreciate the presentation and your hard work and look to see uh, it get implemented and, and then the next iteration uh, as we make it be even better. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Good. Can I all right, can I make a comment or, or a question? Sure. Great. T tell me about the genesis of this. I, I kind of slipped over it at the very beginning, 
how did this stuff, I mean, I know that these kinds of curriculum re related things go on on a, all the time, but uh, this seems to really have caught fire. And uh, how did it kind of come and, and, and land here? And uh, I, I'm just so impressed with uh, all this stuff. I, I taught for 16 years myself, and uh, it's just remarkable that uh, that all this work is going on. And uh, so how did it how did it get started, either uh, Jerome or Wendy? Uh, I'll, I'll start, and we can throw it over to uh, Dr. Hunt or Dr. Scott. Actually, uh, it started really with the um, when we during a flex day. So, Dr. Scott, do you want to just revisit your initial question, and then we can go from there? Uh, sure. Um, uh, Chelsea Otto, it started with um, a, a, an academic senate flex day back in 2018, where we had a speaker who asked us this, all these questions. Have you ever done this? Have you thought about this? You know, a series of questions. And one of them was, have you ever done an audit of your curriculum? And we said no. And so we all came together, members of academic senate, curriculum, guided pathways, equity, faculty professional development. We all came together and said, what would this look like? And then it started a whole series of meetings of, and it took a lot of planning, a lot of work. And uh, Dr. Kinnig and Dr. Uh, Matt Lawrence were very instrumental in a lot of the early work, but it was a massive amount of work. And so, you know, I, I'm, I applaud them for what they did. Yeah, it really had to be, it was a team effort and it was just a nice team that gelled instantly that we were all willing to do it. Uh, nobody felt intimidated about it. It was just, it was genuinely an effort. The, the entire school got involved. Uh, I want to thank institutional effectiveness for helping us with the data because one of the things is really taking a look at our data, the success rates and the individual profiles. Um, we, so much has improved with the sort of the communication of the data so that faculty can actually see their numbers rather than everything being anecdotal because everybody thinks they do a great job in the classroom and many of us do but mo most of us have equity gaps no matter what so we have we had to really pinpoint that to sort of open people's eyes so that that what i think was the genesis of it matt lawrence was really as equity coordinator student equity coordinator he was very excited about this project and um colin williams was involved with out student learning outcomes so many of the initiatives that have already been going on at the school for a long time just really came together to try to focus on practical solutions and so that that would be my explanation. And, and we have the support of the Academic Senate, which I think is very important, too, because this is the work of the faculty. And um, Jerry Florence, I see her on the call. She was always supportive from the very beginning. She helped to select that speaker who asked that question. So, um, you know, it goes back a ways. I have a question. This is just easier. Um, President Mello, I don't know if you're still. Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, First of all, I want to commend you guys um, and um, ladies for this fantastic work. I think it's uh, paramount and very important. Um, I particularly like, <laughs> this is the engineer in me, um, I like page 24 of 26 on the deliverables because, you know, like you said, I don't know if it was you, Kathy, or Wendy, um, uh, or Jerome, um, one of you said this uh, uh, that, hey, you know, we go in these conferences, great ideas, but I'm of the mindset that ideas are free, execution's priceless. So I like how you have an execution a plan in place. Um, and it seems that this is the um, part of the um, onset or the launching of something really fantastic. I like the fact that the intersectionality uh, topic came up. Um, and I'd like to make a suggestion that you coordinate. There is um, uh, someone who happens to be a close friend of mine who just held this, she's having this workshop with council. Her name is Nushi, Dr. Nushin Balizadeh. And she works with the people who actually came up with, uh, invented the word <laughs> intersectionality. And I think she would be a fantastic resource. Um, she has great insight. Uh, perhaps maybe we can have... Um, um, her, you know, present some of the, the work she's done. She's a fa she teaches at USC and um, other um, institutions in UCLA, um, and she may have great insight that could help us or any other folks for that matter that are leading the way. It's an important topic, um, especially with you know the diversity uh, of the students that we have. I particularly would be interested to see what the statistics or the disaggregated data looks like from that front um, uh, and see also uh, if we're talking about equity, I'd also like to have us examine maybe in the 
sequel or a second chapter to this and see how um, it plays out as far as income inequality or equality and um, uh, just really following the um, some of our students and the uh, the ecosystem that they're in after the fact um, and perhaps the tracking the disparities there and what we can do to better support our posterity. Um, if that if I could flag those for you all um, uh, to bear in mind for the next um, the upcoming studies or audits, that would be of particular interest to me. And I'd be very curious to see what those numbers will look like. And thank you again for a fantastic presentation. It was very incisive and insightful. Thank you, Trustee Zia. Yeah, we're very interested in looking at the disaggregated data and we hope to come back and present to the board in the future once we have more information. So thank you for those suggestions and the intersectionality. We'll look into that. Absolutely, thank you. I would like to echo the remarks that my colleagues on the board said. Um, my favorite part was, um, I believe it was page 18, I think it was, it was the um, syllabi, how you compared the before and after syllabus. I, I think that's genius. And I think that um, I'm a visual learner and I think that being a faculty member and having uh, my syllabus up there and having someone show me what my syllabus could look like, that would have been very telling for me. And I also really appreciate the work of the Academic Senate in making sure that um, your audit discovered opportunities for interdisciplinary interaction and for. Oops. Oop, I'm sorry. Did I did I drop out? What was the last thing you heard me say? Uh, you you were back there for a second. Academic Senate intersectionality was the last thing you said. Oh no, I I wasn't. Uh, that was Trustee Zia. I mentioned interdisciplinary studies. And I really appreciate the opportunity for different departments to get together and be able to share input and work together on curriculum. So that was it. I, I think you all did a great job. I'm very happy that this is happening. Very proud of the work that you're doing. And I look forward to seeing what happens in the future with this. And, and like Trustee um, Jimenez said, you know, on behalf of our students, how lucky, how lucky are they to be able to have this on campus? So thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank you. All right, we are going to move on to section five of the agenda. This is 5.1. We are um, in the process of our board self-evaluation and we've all had an opportunity to speak to Dr. Bernie Luskin. I'm going to defer to our superintendent president, Luann Bynum, to introduce Dr. Luskin and uh, they can both talk about our board self-evaluation. Uh, thank you, President Malaulu. Um, introducing Bernie is like introducing a community college celebrity. Um, let me just name off a few things. I can't go through the whole thing, but it'll give you a flavor of his, his vast background and depth and understanding of education and human nature, et cetera. Um, he's had exceptional careers in psychology, education, and corporate life. He's a licensed psychotherapist that never hurts to have a psychotherapist help us all with our evaluation and school psychologist with degrees in business and a UCLA doctorate in education, psychology, and technology. Um, Dr. Luskin has been um, president and CEO of major division Fortune 500 companies um, in, well, we'll get that in a minute. In education, um, he's been CEO of eight colleges and universities. So if anybody's seen it all and experienced it all, I think it is Dr. Luxon. He's been a chancellor of Ventura County Community College District, president of Moore Park, Oxnard, Orange County. He was um, the founding president of Coastline Community College, including the KOCE TV in Orange County, which is um, well respected. Um, he also, in Washington, he served as the Executive Vice President and COO of the American Association of Community Colleges, Chair of the AACC Board of Trustees, and completed a federal, federal, legislative, sorry, federal legislative specialist program as a staff member, member in the U.S. Senate. In corporate right, life, he's been President and CEO of major divisions of Fortune 500 companies, including Philips Interactive Media, Phillips Education, Mind Extension University, Knowledge TV, 
um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just don't want to leave some things out that I think are so exciting. He's a founding board chair of High Tech High LA, a California distinguished um, charter school and was appointed by the governor as a commissioner on the California Post-Secondary um, Education Commission. He's received two Emmys for documentary films, um, Lifetime Achievement Awards from California Community College CEO Association, the Irish government and the European Union, Lifetime Achievement Award for Contributions to Media Psychology from the American Psychological Association, APA Fellow and President Emeritus of the APA Society for Media Psychology, and he publishes articles regularly in Psychology Today in a column called The Media Psychology Effect. Um, he's got a whole list of personal and professional um, activities, and um, the first thing I want to say is that he went to Long Beach City College, so he's a Viking of our own. So we're, we're thrilled to have him here tonight. Um, uh, Dr. Luskin has um, been working with me a bit since I've been on board to help me navigate some things, and we're just really pleased to have him here and um, help with the board. I know he's talked to each one of you, and uh, we're going to ask him to go ahead and just kind of walk us through this self-assessment. And I'll turn it back to you, President Malaulu, if you want to say anything. Well, actually, uh, the only thing I wanted to say is that uh, I never thought it'd be possible to feel that sense of being starstruck via Zoom. But after hearing that introduction, I, you know, I, I'm starstruck with Dr. Luskins. I was very aware of his accomplishments, but listening to you list them like that, I just feel very fortunate that he'll be conducting our board evaluation. So thank you. And Dr. Luskin, take it away. Thank you, uh, President Honolulu. Uh, I ac actually, that's <laughs> That's quite an introduction. I didn't realize my bio was that long, but I've been around a, a long, long time now. And the most significant thing I, I think is that um, I did graduate from Long Beach City College. My wife went to Long Beach City College. My brother went to Long Beach City College. My mother went to Long Beach City College. So Long Beach City College has been a, a real centerpiece in our lives. So. You know, I work with a lot of community and other and four-year colleges on many things now. Um, but uh, being at, with Long, at Long Beach City College is, is very, very special. And uh, you know, Long Beach City College is probably seminal to everything that I've been able to do. It changed my life. But I don't want to get into all, all of that because you uh, uh, President Bynum has given a long introduction, but <clears throat> I ultimately wound up as the separation yeoman getting out of the Navy at the Long Beach uh, Naval Station. And that's how uh, one of the reasons I wound up at Long Beach City College when I got out of the Navy. I just walked over, rented a trailer on Lakewood Boulevard and went to school. So I appreciate everything about Long Beach City College. And I, I'd like to particularly compliment uh, Dr. Scott and Dr. Munoz and the staff and everybody who worked on it, but because the slides on the progress clearly show progress. So that's a good thing. So uh, President Mahalulu, members of the Board of Trustees, students, faculty, staff, and community members, I think that are participating here. I, I look forward to sharing the, the results of the study. Um, I, I hope that the bridge behind me is a bridge to somewhere. That's, that's important, I think. And uh, let me just kind of begin and go through this study. I boiled it down because tonight is a report. Um, Stephen Covey, I don't know if you've ever seen his book. He wrote the seven habits and eight habits and a lot of habits. He said that, uh, you, you can't do very much in one meeting or one weekend. So this is a step and I would take it as a step and uh, we, we go from here. So I need to walk you through this and then maybe we can have a discussion because the complete board evaluation sum summary is attached to the agenda. So you've got the statistics. The pur purpose of the presentation today is to share the results of the board as a whole 
try to stimulate just a bit of discussion to take us to the next step. The items, I, I, you need to realize that these are the self-reported responses from 100% of the board members. Every board member answered every question. And then I spent at least an hour with each board member uh, chatting about the, the district. And um, so this is their look at the mirror in the mirror at themselves. This is not an outside look. It's not my look. This is the board members look at themselves. So I appreciate the candor uh, and honesty that I found in, in uh, talking with the board members. They were, every board member was candid with me and was, I think, uh, candid in the report. So the conclusions are rec are, are rec and recommendations are presented here to assist the board and the president in discussing the board's self-evaluation and results and maybe getting on to the bridge to somewhere. Uh, it, let me go to the next slide, Dario, if you would. And I'm gonna pick up, this survey was divided into individual self-reporting about yourself and then reporting about the board as a whole. What's relevant here tonight and with the board in general is the board's uh, self-assessment of the board's performance. So moving, recognizing that, I'm just gonna go quickly through this. The board member self-assessment of board understanding of the budget and funding uh, formula and the conclusion of the board members were, was that they generally understand the budget and funding formula. So the district business office has done a good job, but there are some parts of it that are not understood at all. It's complex, and I simply point that out because it's something to be addressed, and I'm sure President Bynum will note, make a note of it. Uh, working, with, working with the president superintendent in managing COVID-19 pandemic, I mean, the pandemic is a paradigm shift. It's caught us all off guard. I'm no expert in, use, in doing Zoom board meetings. Uh, you are much more than I am. Uh, because we're in a, 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 a brave new world and it's never going to be quite the same again. So in addition to everything that's going on, uh, the, the paradigm shift will require attention. And I think uh, the, the conclusion is the board members report that the board is performing responsibly and at, ex as a, at an acceptable level because this is an unprecedented cha challenge. Now you gotta realize unacceptable, acceptable is not necessarily good. It's not necessarily outstanding, but it is acceptable. So that's, I think that's uh, good news for tonight. Next slide, please. Uh, working collaboratively to develop and achieve the board's goals, the board members reported that the, it, the board is doing less than a satisfactory job in focusing on the specific board goals in a regular and satisfactory manner. And I emphasize regular because it, the board does look at the goals, but it, it needs to pay attention to the goals because the goals are developed by the board of trustees and that's a trustee obligation then to measurably achieve results where they can of the goals of the Board of Trustees. Working with this resident superintendent, the conclusion, and the reason I put these in red, the conclusions in red is that uh, these were negative reporting. The board itself self reports that it's performing in a less than satisfactory way in communicating and working with and through the president. And you have a, a, a new president President Bynum, uh, so uh, this is self-explanatory, and there are a lot of reasons for that. If you want it during the question period, we can address it. Next slide, please. Understanding the various college constituencies, the board as a whole reports that is doing a less than satisfactory job in serving the various constituencies. That's the different segments uh, of the population. So that's a quite, that's an item for discussion. 
The trustees are appropriately and effectively engaged in the community. The board feels that it's doing a satisfactory job of representing the college at meetings and fundraising activities and conferences. So that's uh, a bit of a plus. Next slide. Maintaining focus on the board's published goals, the board is doing a satisfactory job in maintaining a general focus on the board. Satisfactory not meaning good, not meaning outstanding, not meaning poor, but satisfactory meaning satisfactory. The community perception of the effectiveness and professionalism of the board, the, the self-consensus of the board uh, uh, across the board from every board member is that the, the community perception of the board's performance is poor to unsatisfactory. That's the way the community sees you. Final, uh, next slide. And the board's self-assessment of its own performance by each individual board member uh, unanimously and 100% completing the, this item in the, in the survey uh, led to a unanimous agreement by the board members that the board's overall performance is poor to unsatisfactory. So that leads to recommendations. And I formulated the recommendations. Next slide, please. And uh, let me go through these because you can discuss them or add anything else that you wish. Uh, these can't, I, I spent an hour discussing uh, the situation with each board member. I pulled together what I heard in the conversation. So I heard this from one or, or more of you. And the board acknowledged the, the, the need for the trustee members to work together. There is a desire to work together. They're, they discuss the responsibility of each board member to work with and through the president. You know, you recognize that the president is the only employee of the board of trustees. So everything that the board members do by law and, and by good practice should go through the president and be managed back. And when it's not, you get disarray, confusion, and, and dysfunction. So I just urge the board members to work through, uh, through the president. Consider the need of each board member to become active with the California Community College tr trustees to divide, uh, develop a wider contact and relationship with fellow trustees and districts. You need to know what's going on. There is significant participation on, the, on behalf of the Long Beach City College, but not across the board with all board members and not a complete engagement so that you understand how the other districts work and who they are. If you looked at Peralta, Peralta has problems now and, and uh, President Stroud has, has left partly because of issues with the board. And you, you need to be aware of those things um, uh, I have the, uh, the resignation letter. I think President Bynum has it, if anybody hasn't seen it, but it's, it's worth looking at. Uh, next slide, please. And consider scheduling a retreat to fully discuss items in the self-evaluation survey to measure and improve board's performance. You can only do a tiny bit, and this is a board report. It's, not, it's, not, it's only designed to report the self uh, uh, self results of the board members and consider uh, including a regular board agenda item to help maintain focus on the published board of the board of, uh, goal of the board of trustees. So I just want to point out that the board self assessment is a look back. All of the research you have on all of the data you have is a look back. The purpose of it all is to look ahead. So the bridge needs to go somewhere, both in the data and the performance of the college and in the performance and unity of the board. So with that, with that said, I respectfully submit the report and move to the next slide, which opens it up for questions. I turn it back to President Mahalulu and, and uh, we can you know, have some discussion if you wish. Thank you very much, Dr. Luskin. Wonderful presentation. I appreciate your um, interpretation of the data that you collected. And I'd like to open it up to my colleagues on the board. 
Hey, uh, President Marlu, uh, Trustee Intech here. Hey, I, I, I just want to say uh, thank you, Attorney Player. It's incredibly insightful. Uh, appreciate my all my colleagues' input into it. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's so many times we don't agree, but this looks like something we agree on that uh, we can do better. And I think, you know, as a um, community leader, all of us are community leaders, we have to hold ourselves accountable. Uh, we're responsible for the outcomes that we have, uh, the, the, the assessment that we have before us. Um, we all recognize we can do better, we should do better. Uh, the community expects us to do better. And, uh, you know, I, I can say, you know, I'm, I guess I'm the newest trustee, only barely been on the board for two years. Um, but I, I have tried to do my best to uh, work collaboratively and, um, you know, be open-minded and learn and do my uh, trustee and excellence training with the league. And uh, I even took a course at Dominguez Hills about uh, – college uh, teaching credential, you know, to kind of build on, you know, I, I know, you know, CSU system, but I, I wasn't as fluent in, in our current uh, community college system. This is a way of my own personal development, but it's, um, uh, you know, it's been a wild two years, somewhere between a bad episode of Black Mirror and a telenovela. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, some of it is our making and some of uh, you know, but it's been, uh, we have to focus on the public interest. It can't be about any individuals. It can't be about ourselves. It has to be about the public good in, and about serving the community. And, you know, I, I hope this is a wake up call for us to focus on student outcomes, focus on the learning environment we provide for our faculty and staff, um, you know, focus on the needs of our community because it could not be greater than right now with the pandemic. I mean, we have record unemployment in Long Beach, more than 20%. You know, in barely six months, we went from less than 5% to 20%. It seems like overnight, you know, we, we massive layoffs. You know, I've done a number of food drives, you know, two and a half mile long, you know, um, car lines of cars that get two boxes of food. You know, it's 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 kind of surreal uh, the the times we're in and the environment we're in. And usually we say, you know, when the economy is bad, uh, it's inverse relationship. We get more students. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to happen. Digital divide has been exposed. People don't have good Internet, don't have technology, don't have equal access to the Internet. And so if that's our only portal due to this, um, you know, forced isolation, it makes it really difficult. I mean, we see the numbers and the, the infection rates and the fatalities in communities of color more so than others and underlying health conditions and black and Latinx communities are suffering the worst. You know, just a news article the other day that the um, API communities has some of the highest surging rates in this new, you know, new second wave now. And those are our students. Those are our community uh, you know, those are our friends and family who are in need and are in pain and suffering. And we're all dealing with the pandemic in our own different ways. But, uh, you know, I'm thankful that Luann uh, took the job. She didn't have to. <laughs> you know, she could have uh, stayed in retirement. But it's uh, and we've had a rocky road, but it's um, I think we're on a positive trajectory forward. Um, you know, I think we're trying to do the best we can under an incredibly difficult situation. I mean, you know, I've talked to faculty members about the online training and we heard earlier, like, I've never taught online before. I didn't have any content designed that way. I had not familiar using Canvas or any of our online tools. What a challenge in a forced, you know, legitimate public health crisis, global public health crisis. So um, I just want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Luskin for putting this together and my colleagues participating. And I hope this is a chance for and focus on what matters and uh, we can do better because we, we all recognize we need to do better. President Malulu, may I speak? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Bernie, Dr. Luskin, um, I enjoyed our time together. I thought it was really worthwhile. 
I am so glad that he suggested that we have a retreat in which we uh, further discuss the goals and and how we're doing. And um, thank you very much for uh, bringing your expertise to LBCC, and I truly appreciate it. Thank you, Trustee Otto, Trustee Zia. So well, well, I'll, I'll weigh in a little bit on this. I was uh, uh, dumbstruck by the honesty and the sincerity of the responses of the board, not only about their own personal feelings about how they were each doing or how we were each doing, but um, about their candid uh, acknowledgement that there are issues here and that the issues are getting in the way of us being the best uh, board and the best um, uh, community college that we can be. And uh, it, it affects our accreditation. It affects our ability to uh, go out and get a, uh, a full-time superintendent president. And uh, the fact that the board is acknowledging that there are issues and a willingness, most importantly, to work together to do this is, uh, I think, very, very encouraging and, uh, and heartwarming. Um, I, I was struck <clears throat> in particular that the, um, the, um, you know, the, the 20th question, rate the, rate the board's performance as a whole and being supportive of each other and working together towards achieving district and college goals and um, nobody thought it was outstanding. Nobody thought it was even good. Nobody thought it was even acceptable. 40% uh, of that means two uh, thought it was poor. Uh, and 60% uh, and thought that there was no performance or that we weren't doing anything at all. And if that's not a wake up call, I don't know what is. And uh, we are elected officials. We are people that are serving the public and uh, uh, and I think that uh, that what we're telling each other is we have to find a way to uh, to come together in the governance of this uh, institution. It is a storied institution, like uh, uh, Bernie acknowledged. Not I mean, we, we did a communication study four years ago, and in that communication study, we hired people to go out and talk to people in the community, and it was almost as if there was nobody in Long Beach that didn't either go here, have a relative go here, have a, uh, a, a child go here, and they had very, very high opinions of Long Beach City College. Long Beach has become known as an educational town, and Long Beach City College is a uh, is, is a very, very important part of that. And uh, it requires work. It requires uh uh, sitting back a little bit and saying, how can we do this? How can we do better? And uh, like I said, I, I, this is the first time that I've really seen an acknowledgement that, that that's what we ought to be doing and that we can do that. And I'm looking forward to a retreat or opportunities to, to talk to people more about uh, uh, what it takes and, uh, uh, and what to do. We, we've been down a, a, a very, uh, a uh, long and difficult path, but I think this is a, a line in the sand where we can say, okay, uh, we get it. We all seem to get it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and what are we going to do with this? And uh, so, uh, Bernie, thank you for uh, your work. Luann, thank you for uh, involving B Bernie and for the leadership that you're providing. I I remember the meeting that we had in June where both the president of the academic Senate and the classified Senate said, it's so great to work with Luann to help us uh, heal. It's such a, a, a great atmosphere now to, uh, to, to be able to feel that we can work together. And uh, it's, I, I'd like to think this is, this is just another step in that direction. So that's my thoughts. President. Okay, thank you. Yes, Trustee Zia, go ahead. I, I just uh, think um, everything I wanted to say has been 
said, um, I concur. And thank you, Dr. Luskin, for a fair characterization of where we're at. I look forward to the path forward. Like I said, ideas are free. We had a lot. We have a lot of ideas. We like that, but you know, I'd like to see more solutions and execution on uh, some of the recommendations. So I look forward to that, and you know, working together because we're better together. Well, I, I agree with everything that my colleagues have said. Um, we have a, a very intelligent board, and I'm very proud um, that we all seem to agree. But, um, you know, as has been evident in the past, is that uh, we, we tend to, you know, we, we talk the talk, but we don't walk the talk. We don't walk the walk. And hopefully Dr. Luskin will be able to help us facilitate that because nobody wants to be just talking about it. We want to be about it. And one other thing that I would just like to mention that um, Dr. Leskin, during our meeting, um, I really appreciated something that you said where I shared with you uh, some of my personal frustrations, um, not just being, you know, vice president or president and the things that happened uh, while I've been in those offices, but just as a trustee in general, and uh, the, the basic congeniality that I felt was missing. Um, and you said something that uh, I'm going to hold you to. You said, well, give me a chance. You said, give me an opportunity to be able to work on that. And I trust you, and I hope that it really does happen. I do look forward to some kind of retreat. And also that my colleagues can make the that also that my colleagues can, you know, make the same commitment so that we can all understand that we're all on the same page and, um, you know, we, you know, we can work that out. Um, if nobody else has anything to say, then Dr. Luskin, I just want to thank you again. I'd like really to appreciate some comments if I can. Time. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Just to close it off and, and, uh, uh just say that, uh, number one, it's important to know and to recognize that th this is a self-assessment. And as Trustee Otto said, you know, it was very candid. I had a very positive conversation with every board member. And so, and, and with me, uh, my interpretation was that there's certainly a love of the district. There's a love of the college. There's a love of Long Beach. There's a, there's a, there's a, a desire. To, for Long Beach City College to be all that it can be. And it's an iconic community college district. I mean, it's one of the older districts, one of the mature districts. You're blessed because Long Beach is a destination, so you're not isolated or hidden out. Every, the world sees you all the time. So I think that that's important. And I, my conclusion uh, after talking with the trustees is, you have more in common than you realize. I said, that's, that's very important. And everybody, every trustee expressed a desire to do good. So the goodness and the, the, the desire is there. And so we can spend some retreat time and a while their time and so forth. Uh, you know, hopefully with the, if you want to, you know, begin to work hand in hand to the future. You can do it. I've seen it happen. <laughs> President Biden mentioned that I've been the CEO of eight colleges and, and universities, mostly because I got in to do what she's doing right now to bridge a situation uh, and, and help to make it better because of uh, situations not unlike what the, this report showed. And I just wanted to comment about uh, President Biden you know, all jobs are interim. So she's the president, <laughs> period, as far as I'm concerned, because there's no forgiveness or anything there. You either are or you're not. And when you come, you're there for the time that you're there. It can be months. It can be years. It can be decades. And that's it. And so I, I think you need to recognize it and give, and, and give her the attention that, that the president of, uh, deserves not consider it to be a filling in in any any in any way because actually she's in a position to be very helpful in straightening it out 
And I was in a meeting yesterday when somebody was talking about uh, board, uh, board participation, the role of the CEO. And I'm telling you, it's not a 40 hour a week job. It's an 80 hour a week job. It's 40 hours with the trustees. You, every single trustee needs to pay attention to her and she will be responsive. And the other 40 hours, she can pay attention to the executive staff and doing the other things. That's the nature of that job. If you don't not willing to do that, you shouldn't take the job because that's that's really what it is. So that's my my view. Um, I, I think uh, he, this study completes the accreditation requirement, and so I think it's graciously been done. Uh, I tried to say it's just a look back, an honest look back. And when the accreditation team comes and look at this, looks at the study, it's important to tell them that the board looked at itself very candidly and, and started walking across the bridge to somewhere because that's what it takes. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to do this. I really care about Long Beach City College, and I think you've got one of the finest institutions in the country. I mean, you deserve to be everything, uh, every accolade that the district can get because it provides such a service. And one final thing, and I've said this to other board members, Long Beach City College is in a, in a, in a very contained area. You have Long Beach, Lakewood, and so forth. It's blessed. It's not like L.A. that's broken into all pieces. So you have an articulation relationship with the Unified School District. You've got several school districts. You can, you can work together. You've got a direct link to Cal State University, Long Beach. You've even got board members who teach there. You've got a, a perfect relationship, as good as it gets, for a P20 or a PK to gray relationship to be the, the centerpiece of everything that goes on. So I urge you to do that, work through President Bynum, and I, I look forward to helping in any way that I can in the future. Very nice. And the item. Well, certainly appreciate that. And and Dr. Leskin, uh, I, I think I, I can't remember. I, I know I said it to somebody. I don't know if it was you or Luann, but um, I, <laughs> my my term as president has been probably the hardest in the history of the college um, in terms of it being lengthened by six months and then the pandemic, among other things. So it, it's just been a difficult 10 years. So hopefully the, the last six months of me being president will be a little bit smoother. So thank you again. Thank you, Appreciate everyone. Yeah. Is it Marlula? And Yes. Uh, I, I thought it was a really good PowerPoint presentation, but I didn't see it on the board docs. Did it, um, are we going to add it on or get shared around afterwards? <laughs> uh, Trustee Ud uh, Intuck, I can mail, email that to you all, and we okay. can even add it to the board docs. But that was that's included in the evaluation that's on there, but his recommendations were not. So we'll, okay. we'll get that out to you. In fact, I'll do it right now, okay? Uh, that would be great. Thank you, Jackie. You're welcome. Thank I would you. Just, I, I would just say to President Malaulu, it probably feels like this has been an 18-month term instead of a 12-month term, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I just pray that the next six months are just smooth sailing as we as we go on from here. But it'll be okay. We got Dr. Leskin. We got Luann. It's gonna. Things are gonna get better. So if there's no other item, uh, no other issue with this item, then I'm going to move on to section six. And Dr. Leskin, thank you again. Thank you for joining us. And we will be in touch. So we're going to move on to section six on the agenda, which is the consent calendar. Is there anybody who needs to take something off the consent? Yeah. All right, hearing none, I will entertain a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Someone else. We've got a we've got a motion by Trustee Zia, second by student trustee Jimenez. Any discussion? Uh, could I have a, another second by a trustee? Trustee Untuck with a second. Trustee Untuck with a second. Any discussion? All those in favor or actually, Madam Secretary, can you please take roll call vote? Yes. Student uh, Jimenez? 
Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduak Joe Intuk? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Penny Zia? Aye. Motion carries. And now we're going to move on to just a second. My screen just. Um, 7.1. Froze here. 7.1, uh, section seven on the agenda, human resources. This is item 7.1, the approval of the LBCCD, AFT, AFL-CIO tentative agreement. I'll entertain a motion, please. So move as trustee into. Second, student trustee. Second. We've got a motion by Trustee Untuck, uh, uh, honorary second by student Trustee Jimenez, and I believe that was Dr. Baxter with the official second? Yes, thank you. Okay, we've got Dr. Baxter with the second. Any discussion on this item? Can I ask about um, kind of the, what changes were, were in this one versus uh, last time? I see some strikeouts in the draft on the agenda. I will defer that to Vice President Jean Duran. Sure. So, so what, what you see is actually the um, uh, edits to the current contract based on the new language that we agreed on. Um, so I don't know if the question is about each individual article. There were several. Um, or what additional information you might need, Trustee Inter? Jean, weren't those, uh, weren't those demonstrated um, when you first showed what the changes were? Is that right? It's just a continuation showing what the changes were. Correct. Okay. Yeah, Gene, maybe you can walk through it for the public real quick. Sure. So I think I think what's important to walk through is um, really the, the the title page, which shows that um, on paying allowance, there's a two percent on schedule ongoing increase uh, for 2021. Um, in addition, um, holidays there were actually. No changes, uh, but there was some back and forth, so we noted that. Um, on evaluation, there was some uh, cleanup language and some clarification uh, so that it's clearer in line with what our current practice is. Um, on layoff and reemployment, we streamlined um, the seniority list so it'll be easier to understand and actually easier for the HR staff to actually produce it in a timely manner. Um, disciplinary action, we cleaned up some language and removed some language that was in there previously that actually uh, by code wasn't really operative. Um, in addition, it shows a three-year term, <clears throat> which is for this year and the next two years. And then uh, with one reopener in the final year, so it'll be one fiscal and two one fiscal reopeners in the final year. And then we just simply updated all the language so that it's more uh, gender, gender neutral um, in the pronouns and uh, in the phrasing of the contract. Thank you so much for outlining any key differences, uh, Vice President Duran. Trustee Untuck, did that answer your questions? Yeah, I uh, think that was a good summary and uh, glad to see the different items and the I know holidays has been a hot topic, uh, a discussion, and, and good to see that was a, you know, discuss like the bargaining process and um, that there's a couple of reopener opportunities if necessary and that uh, we got the pronouns uh, situated that um, hopefully we can continue to have, uh, you know, unbiased uh, content and, and how we uh, address folks in different formats. So that's a good addition. Thank you. Thank you. Let me um, make a comment. Yes, absolutely. I just wanted to thank staff and our classified union for their hard work. Um, I am so incredibly impressed by all of you. You take care of us. Um, and uh, I just really wanted to share my heartfelt gratitude, um, especially during this uh, economic misery and pandemic. I know it's not easy for you all and really, truly appreciate you and I'm grateful to you. President Malulu, may I say one thing? Yes, of course. Um, I also want to praise the staff, and I, I want to bring up uh, actually two things I like. 
Um, first of all, uh, I have to tell you, whenever I've had to ask a question and I email um, a, a member of the classified staff, they answer immediately. And I, I truly, truly appreciate that. And the second thing I wanted to bring up is at our homeless meeting, um, Angela Folks, who is a, um, a, on this uh, financial aid staff, brought up um, the concept of the Cranium Cafe. And I know Dr. Munoz brought it up, but it didn't hurt to, uh, for her to show us how when a student enters this Cranium Cafe, she can have other people join her so that they can have all their question answered at once. And I'm sure Dr. Munoz, you told us that, but it didn't stick in till she was showing how she and, and Tamara Lincoln and Justin Mendez could solve a homeless student's problem right then and there. They didn't have to be sent to somebody else and somebody else because that's so frustrating, um, in particular when you're homeless, but in general, uh, as Dr. Luskin pointed out, students uh, want to be have answers right away. And um, so I, I really want to praise them also for doing such a good job and coming up with such innovative ideas. Those are great comments, Trustee Baxter. Trustee Otto, uh, before I make my remarks, would you like to add anything? No, I'm fine. I'm just uh, uh, glad that the contract has been uh, reached and uh, I uh, share the other board members' appreciation for the work that uh, the classifieds do uh, and keep this college running. So. I agree. Once again, uh, I don't have anything original to add to this. The um, my colleagues on the board have hit every nail on the head. Uh, the only different thing that I would just like to say is that I'm very happy that the classified staff also achieved a contract with um, an increase in pay. I think that that's important and I'm happy that we are able to do that. And I'm happy that as a board, we are able to work with the administration and um, hammer out a contract where at least the the uh, employee's value is recognized uh, financially, and I'm very happy that my colleagues on the board also agree with that. Um, it's important, I believe, uh, in the old adage that every laborer is worth his wages, and I'm very happy that we're able to do that, especially in these times when we've asked so much from so many, and we've had so many, especially classified employees, put themselves on the front line uh, against COVID with disinfecting buildings and uh, campus um, cleanup and beautification. I think that it, it's just critical that the board recognizes and acknowledges that. So congratulations. I'm very happy. We haven't voted yet, but I have a feeling it'll be a good vote. So with that, Madam Secretary, if you can please call the vote. Malulu, can I make one addition? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that, um, you know, uh, about, um, you know, negotiations and collective bargaining that, this is a protected activity under law that there's a the PERB, the Public Employee Relations Board that has rulings and uh, allows for the, you know, negotiations to happen, which is, you know, arguably one of the only areas that people can collectively come together and, and uh, work on their own employment, you know, in their best interests of whether it's pay or benefits or um, hiring process or evaluation process, you know, it's one of the uh, unique uh, benefits of America is, is uh, our collective bargaining. And I just wanted to clarify that there is a PERB decision, 27, that allows an exclusive representation to have the right to engage directly or indirectly in advocacy with the employer's elected and unelected officials, up to and including the employee's highest level, providing exclusive representation that does not make the collective bargaining proposal uh, to that ex exclusive representation not only available as made in uh, negotiations with the employer's ch chosen bargaining team. That just to clarify, if there's any staff that is unclear the the rights that uh, workers have, whether that's the classified, the part-time faculty, the building trades union, any any union has ability to to indirectly uh, advocate for their contract either with uh, elected officials or with city officials on, on their terms that they so choose. And it, it's, uh, I, I had heard some misunderstanding of that, that uh, 
and somehow the can talk to the board and the board couldn't talk to the faculty union and that's actually illegal to direct that and wanted to make sure that everyone's aware of the PERB ruling and that the, 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 the laws that they are here in California. So I just wanted to say that before we vote, but I, I am in support. Thank you very much, Trustee Untuck. Madam Secretary, if you could please take roll. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Udwak Joe Intuck. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Absolutely. Motion carries. Thank you all once again. Congratulations to our AFT classified staff. Uh, there is nothing under Section 8 of the Agenda for Academic Senate. Moving on to Section 9 on the Agenda for Academic Affairs. Item 9.1 is an action item, Revised Board Policy 4011 Scholarship. In accordance with established practice, the board policy has been distributed, discussed, and approved by the President's Leadership Council, the Revised Board Policy 4011 was submitted for first reading at the Board of Trustees meeting on June 24, 2020. It is now presented for approval. The changes are being recommended as a result of our ongoing review to ensure compliance with legal code and align with current practice. For the benefit of the public, the revised board policy scholarship 4011-4011 is attached to the agenda. I will entertain a motion and a second, please. So moved. Second, Trustee Untuck. We've got a motion by Trustee Baxter, second by Trustee Untuck. Any discussion? Madam Secretary, if you could please call roll. Student Trustee Jimenez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Udwak Joe Intuck? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. Motion carries. Item 9.2, Revised Board Policy 4012, Statement of Academic Freedom. In accordance with established practice, the board policy has been distributed, discussed, and approved by the President's Leadership Council. The Revised Board Policy 4012 was submitted for first reading at the Board of Trustees meeting on June 24, 2020. It is now presented for approval. The changes are being recommended as a result of our ongoing review to ensure compliance with legal code and align with current practice. Again, that um, board policy, the revised board policy 4012 is attached. I'll entertain a motion and a second, please. So move. Second. second. Motion by Trustee Baxter, second by Trustee Zia. Any discussion? I had a Madam question. Secretary. Oh yes, Trustee Antek. This is about academic freedom uh, and just wanted to ask, it, it, it seems like a minor change of faculty versus professional staff. Was there uh, academic freedom beyond faculty before and now this is being limited? You know, uh, so, uh, excuse me, and maybe I can respond to that. This is, this is a term specifically for faculty. Um, it, it had been, this, this uh, policy had been around since 1978. It's possible that the language has just changed, but it's always been a term that's referred to the work of the faculty. And if I and I know that uh, Dr. Kennig is still on the line, and she can certainly um, add anything if I'm incorrect. No, that that's correct. Thank you. Yeah, Michelle's on too. We need. And I, Trustee Entech, is that sufficient for you? Good. I just have one more question on. Um, you know, I, I support academic freedom, and uh, it's, a, it's an invaluable asset. Um, just, just wanted to ask quickly on, uh, you know, how does this play in freedom of speech? You know, if someone tweets something uh, versus what they do something in classroom or there's a limitation. I mean, everybody talks about freedom of speech and there's still consequences with freedom of speech, but how does that intertwine with academic freedom in this uh, policy? You know, I may ask um, Vice President Duran to weigh in on this, but there is a difference between a personal tweet outside of the work environment and what happens in the classroom. And um, with, with, with academic freedom, it does come with responsibility, of course. It's not just singularly complete freedom, um, but there is a difference between what, what happens in a personal life and a professional classroom. So I'll let Vice President Duran weigh in. 
I think Dr. Scott, exactly what you said is correct. You know, there, there is a distinction between uh, an employee's freedom to speak while they're working, while they're representing the district, and what they do on their own time while on break or otherwise. So, yes. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. Can I say something? This is Jerry. Yes, um, of we have The Senate has worked in conjunction with Gene uh, prior to this and prior to him, it was Cindy Biscuitchill, who was in the HR area. And there are etiquette rules that we share with the faculty and that we share with staff, but I'm really from the faculty side of the house. So, um, but we work very hard to have people understand what the parameters are and you know what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. And um, so maybe that will help as well. Thank you, Jerry. It's clear that, um, that it's not carte blanche. You can do and say anything because of freedom of speech or academic freedom. And I, I, and I think it's clear uh, the explanation. And But sometimes I have heard that uh, people are unclear and think they can say, you know, you know, live or die free, whatever they want to say, that uh, there's still accountability for what people do and say. And, that there is still accountability and there's still an expectation. And part of that is gone. We go over that with the new faculty cohorts from College Culture Fridays about what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. So I know it's addressed with the new faculty through that training. Um, and I know that Jean and I in the past have talked about resending uh, the email etiquette specifically because that kind of tends to be where things kind of happen um, to resend that out to faculty uh, just as a reminder you know, that these, we have a, an expectation of professionalism and we have an expectation, you know, this isn't an education, a higher education institution, but we also have an obligation to ourselves and to our students. So I can certainly work with Gene and we can work together and get that out as a reminder to faculty. That's great, Jerry. Thank you so much. And I have some uh, alarming tweets from people um, that I, I, I didn't know. Was it academic freedom or personal tweets and, I'm, you know, if we're still in America and people can say whatever they want, but sometimes there are consequences for it. Uh, Chair Malalu, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I think this is a great discussion and I appreciate the topic brought up because I had questions on this as well back in 2016 um, and I was told it's protected under academic uh, freedom. We had a faculty member who was campaigning for the Trump administration or the Trump candidate Trump at the time um, and the superintendent um, president uh, at the time told me that it's, it's protected. So I'd be curious to see um, if the, what exactly is the etiquette, um, if it's something that could be shared with the board. Um, just for my own edification um, as well, I was frankly surprised and, um, you know, some of the discussion points. It just sounded like uh, it wasn't in the uh, realm of um, academia, um, but it was a political science professor. I get that. And then, you know, the, the professor was teaching in a um, Make America Great Again um, <laughs> cap. So I'm just curious to understand, like, what is exactly is this domain and the uh, confines of it? Personally, because it's been a question, lingering question for me for the past four years, and um, it'd be wonderful to have some insight on that front. Sure, fair enough, fair enough. Gene, do you want to weigh in? Uh, so, I, you know, we'll be happy to share with the board and just publish it at large uh, the document that we release and the guidance that we give uh, to the best of our um, ability and understanding of what the law is and what the abilities are. And sure. academic freedom as it relates to pedagogy and actually teaching the class relative to uh, those things that are in fact someone's personal view, which may not be appropriate to be conveyed while they are working in their capacity as a district employee. And it's a, it can be a fine line and right now, it's, you know, things are a bit heightened um, and things are getting blurred and um, we'll, we'll do our best to see if we can straighten the lanes out to the best of our ability. I'm certainly not advocating for um, canceling people out in this cancel oh, culture yeah, that we were living in. I sure. think it's important for people to be able to express their First Amendment, right? Sure. And which is the crown jewel of our constitution. But um, it'd just be nice to see. And then is, if, if it's possible to have it a little bit more elucidated in the social media world and um, 
some of the things that um, Trustee Intuck brought up, I think there were really great points about tweets. Um, I certainly don't know what the um, those ground rules or parameters are. Like, how, wh wh where is the line on those fronts? If you guys can provide that to us um, in that sure. communication and cover that, the social media aspect as well, that would be fun. I think the only distinction I would make, and it would be quite general, is is the person acting at, on their own in their own private um, communication, acting through a mode that, in fact, the district um, has controls our social media and that kind of thing. And those are the things that we address when they do come up, um, and they have come up recently, and we have addressed them. Right, and if you could just include if there's any case law that has been recent in that respect, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate some of the remarks that were made regarding this policy and any subsequent conversation that uh, resulted from it. Um, I, I do agree that um, educators should be held above reproach when it comes to a certain level of professionalism and tact. And sometimes um, I've seen it where uh, people are in the classroom and they abuse their platform um, rather than sharing information impartially or objectively, they tend to pontificate their own ideas and um, oftentimes they fall on impressionable minds of students. So I do think that there's a fine line there as far as, um, you know, discussions in classrooms. But we live in an age where social media is also... Um, an extension of ourselves. And we do have to be very careful, especially when we represent an institution. And uh, I understand the concern of the First Amendment and the protection, but we also have to care deeply about our students. And we have to care deeply about the community that we represent. And sometimes our ideals are not consistent with the work that needs to be done to heal our communities. And uh, it's very troubling, it's very disheartening. And, and I would love to expand on this conversation as well. I don't think this particular policy, um, academic freedom um, really addresses that, but perhaps this is something that as a district, we can maybe just branch off a little bit and, and talk about it some other way. I know we have college day coming up and I know that there are times where we could have professional development to talk about these things, but I would love to hear um, some expert opinion and have um, perhaps some research done to see, you know, what happens if a professor is, is sharing an opinion or an employee is sharing an opinion. Um, it's just that it's an opinion, but it, it could be very hurtful to our students. So I want to make sure that we are sensitive. Um, President Malauulu, if I may, this is uh, Kathy Scott. Um, this is just the policy, which is always much shorter than the regulation that provides a significant amount of detail. Um, the, the regulation didn't come forward tonight for approval. It was approved previously, um, but it does have a lot of information about the boundaries and about and, and the information that might be helpful to you. I would, I would love to have that. If you're able to share the entire um, context of it with the board, I, I think that would be very interesting to read. Yes, absolutely. It's available on our website, and, but we can certainly forward it to the board. Yeah, yeah. There's, the policy, there's the policies and then there's the regulations. The policies are always broad. The regulations are very detailed. Yes, if I might also, too. The board is the one who... Um, confirms and sets the policy and it's the responsibility of me working through the constituent groups to set the regulations for the policy. But we, I mean, certainly we can share that with everybody. I think that's important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we do have a motion and a second. Madam Secretary, if you could please take roll. Student Trustee Jimenez. Aye. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduwak Joe Intuck. Aye. Doug Otto. Doug Otto. Aye. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Moving on to item 9.3. This is revised board, excuse me, revised board policy. 
4022, course repeatability and credit course repetition. In accordance with established practice, the board policy has been distributed, discussed, and approved by the President's Leadership Council. The revised board policy 4022 was submitted for first reading at the Board of Trustees meeting on June 24th, 2020, is now presented for approval. The changes are being recommended as result of ongoing review to ensure compliance with legal code and align with current practice. I'll entertain a motion in a second. So moved. We've got a motion by Trustee Zia, and I believe that was Trustee Untuck with the second. I think it was Trustee Otto, Chair Malibu. Trustee Otto with the second. Any discussion? Madam Secretary, if you could please take roll. Student Trustee Jimenez. Aye. Virginia Baxter. Aye. William Malaulu. Aye. Udwak Joe Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Shani Zia. Aye. Motion carries. Item 9.4, revised board policy and administrative regulations, 4028, course credit and credit for prior learning. This is also an action item. And I, we have four other ones, and, and they're all in accordance with established practice um, with the President's Leadership Council approval. These um, board policies were submitted for first reading at the Board of Trustees meeting on June 24th, 2020. They're being presented for approval. The changes are recommended as a result of ongoing review of our board policies. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. Second, second Trustee Intuk. Trustee Baxter, I believe, had the motion, and I, I think I heard Trustee Zia uh, with the second. Sorry, it was me, student trustee. We do sound the student same way. Student trustee. Okay. I mean, every time a student trustee makes a motion, we still need a, an additional motion or a second for the record. Any discussion on this item? I think it was Trustee Intuk who also yes. seconded. Trustee Intuk. Trustee Untuk with the second. Any discussion on this item? Okay, Madam Secretary, if you could please take roll, roll call vote. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Yes. Just, um, you know, this is a change for prior learning. Um, does this also count for like life experience or on the job experience to get, to be eligible for some credit? That's coming up. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, thanks. And Madam then, Secretary. Student Trustee Jimenez. Aye. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Udwak Joe Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. And Sunny Zia. Aye. Motion carries. Item 9.5, new board policy and administrative regulations 40XX contract education. This is a motion. This is also an action item. In accordance with established practice, the board policy administrative regulation have been distributed, discussed, and approved by the President's Leadership Council. The new board policy 40XX was submitted for first reading at the Board of Trustees meeting on June 24, 2020. It's now presented for approval. The changes are being recommended as a result of ongoing review to ensure compliance with legal code and align with current practice. Is there a so motion and a second? So moved, Trustees. Yeah. <laughs> second. Trustee Zia with the motion, Trustee Baxter with the second. Any discussion? Madam Secretary, if you can please take a roll call vote. Student Trustee Jimenez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduwak Joe Intuk? Uh, yeah, aye. <laughs> Doug Otto? Aye. And Sonny Zia? Aye. Motion carries. Item 9.6, new board policy and administrative regulations 40XX, multiple and overlapping enrollments. In accordance with established practice, the board policy and administrative regulation have been distributed, discussed, and approved by the President's Leadership Council. New board policy 40XX was submitted first reading, Board of Trustees meeting June 24, 2020, is now presented I thought we for just approval. Voted for that. Didn't we just vote for four zero XX? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to yes, interrupt there, you. There's several that are four zero XX. Uh, I, I gotcha. I apologize. <laughs> is now presented for approval. The changes are being recommended as a result of our ongoing review to ensure compliance with legal code and align with current practice. Can I get a motion and a second? So, so moved. moved. 
Okay. Trustee Zia made the motion, and I think Trustee Baxter seconded. Trustee Zia with the motion, Trustee Baxter with a second. Any discussion? Madam Secretary, if you can please take roll. Student, roll call vote. Student Trustee Jimenez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Woodwalk Joe Intuck? Aye. Uh, Doug Otto? Aye. And Sunny Zia. Aye. Motion carries. Now we're moving on to item 9.7. New board policy and administrative regulations 40XX nursing program. In accordance with established practice, this is also an action item. Uh, board policy administrative regulation has been distributed, discussed, and approved by the President's Leadership Council. New board policy 40XX was submitted. First reading at the Board of Trustees meeting June 24th, 2020 is not presented for approval. The changes are being recommended as a result of our ongoing review to ensure compliance with legal code and align with current practice. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee Otto, second by, was that Trustee Zia? Student trustee, there needs to be another second. Second. Student trustee Jimenez and trustee Baxter with the official second. Any discussion? Madam Secretary, roll call vote, please. Student Trustee Jimenez. Aye. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Joe Intuck. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Motion carries. And the last item in section nine on the agenda, 9.8, new board policy and administrative regulation 40XX work experience. This is also an action item. In accordance with established practice, board policy and administrative regulation have been distributed, discussed, and approved by the President's Leadership Council. New board policy 40XX was submitted for first reading at the Board of Trustees meeting on June 24, 2020. It is now presented for approval. Changes are being recommended as a result of our ongoing review to ensure compliance with legal code in line with current practice. Motion and a second, please. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Otto, second by Trustee, was that Zia? No, Baxter. Baxter, any discussion? All right, uh, Madam Secretary, if you can please take a roll call vote, please. Student Trustee Jimenez? Aye. Excuse me, Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduak Joe Intuck? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. And Sunny Zia? Aye. Motion carries. And just for the benefit of the public, that all of those new board policies are attached um, in board docs, so uh, members of the public can view them. We're moving on to section 10 on the agenda. There is nothing under administrative and business services. Section 11 on the agenda, student services. We do have a presentation for the Veterans Resource Update, and Dr. Munoz will lead us in this discussion. Dr. Munoz, I'll defer to you. Thank you. Good evening, um, members of the Board of Trustees, campus leadership, the community. Um, I'm going to be providing a brief update on our Veteran Service Center, um, as well as presenting um, our Veteran Resource Guide that we launched this past week. Um, so just before we cue the video, I'm going to give you just a little bit of context. So our video that we created really highlights our services, our outstanding and exemplary services, um, and the way that we serve our, our veterans on campus with our team. Um, on my first day, when I actually started as vice president of student services like two years, over two years ago, Ahmed Hani was here, and he gave me a tour of the facilities. And one of the first facilities I vi visited was our Veteran Resource Center. And as you remember, it was located in the basement of the E building. It was not ADA accessible, so if you were a veteran that had mobility issues, they couldn't serve you. You couldn't even enter the center. You had to, someone had to go up and be able to meet you upstairs and provide services, as well as our services were disjointed. We had some services for veterans located in enrollment services and some services located in that center down in the E basement. And so it was a priority for us to really find a better solution for our veterans. And so working with Vice President Drinkwine at the time, we were able to um, identify resources, as well as I was able to really work with the enrollment services team to identify really good real estate within the A building that allowed our veterans to be co-located and have all their services in one um, 
easy, accessible location, prime location on campus. And so you're going to see in this video highlighting the new physical kind of space that our, our veterans now have. And we're very proud of that. So um, we'll cue the video and then I'll do a brief overview of our veteran resource guide. So if um, we can start the video, Dario, thank you. When you first walk through our doors, myself and my colleague, we are both civilians. Um, our first line of defense is another veteran who has walked in your shoes. When you walk in, you're going to see another veteran's face who is going to have that familiar familiarity that can say, I understand, brother. I understand, sister. Let's, let's walk you through this. The Veterans Services Office is really important to uh, Long Beach City College. It's very beneficial for veterans, uh, especially the ones who are seeking a career or just getting out of the military, because uh, they're trying to find out what they want to do next after separating themselves from the military. Uh, so they come in here and they get a lot of assistance in terms of how to use their benefits. Uh, and it, it works out for them because they, they have a lot of other veterans that are here and that camaraderie that they have from when they were in the military, they have that here as well. They'll give information on uh, maybe what classes to take when instructors are good, uh, helping them with tutoring and things like that. Um, and for me, it, it's beneficial just to be able to help them because a lot of them, when they get out of the military, they're not really sure where to go next. There are so many resources, not only at the college, but at the Veterans Center. And just walking in there, I just automatically feel like I'm walking onto one of my old Coast Guard units where everybody just knows each other. There's like a camaraderie. So I immediately feel comfortable and it helped with being nervous as far as going back to school and being so much, maybe not so much, but being like older than most of the students. First got here, I was still having difficult time transitioning from, you know, five years of being in the military and only doing one thing, and then only getting one week to learn how to be a civilian or a normal human being again. There, there was a difficult time transitioning. So coming here, I it kind of brought me back into like not necessarily military life, but being around people like that. Um, made that transition a little easier, you know, and I, I love it. You know, it's, it's my home away from home. You may have known everybody for a whole semester, two semesters, or you may, may have just met them yesterday, but you're going to be comfortable. You're going to be welcomed in and you're going to have a good time, but you just got to step foot through that door. That's, that's it. That's always just the first step. And once you do that, you're going to, you're going to wish you did it sooner. Thank you, Dario. So as you can see, um, we are very proud of the Enrollment Services and Veteran Resource Center team that are providing those exemplary services and just really the sense of community that that new physical space and location has created. I mean, it's right off the A courtyard. As you notice, it's not just a service center, but there's a full lounge as well as a, it didn't quite show in the video, but there's a computer, a bank of computers that they are able to use as a resource with um, access to printers. And so it's really just created a very strong sense of community for our veterans. And that's what you know we really wanted to achieve. And so I, again, I wanna commend um, the Veteran Resource Center staff and team for, for building that, that sense of inclusion and, and brave space for our veterans. Um, if Dario, if you can pull up the uh, Veteran Service Resource Guide. I'm not gonna walk you through the entire resource guide because it's available online. But um, I believe it was Trustee Malulu who had recommended that, you know, as we were rolling out our series of resource guides for our, our, our Black Student Resource Guide and our Latinx Student Resource Guide, there was a recommendation about thinking about creating a resource guide um, for our veterans. And so this is a, a, a sneak peek. Like I said, I would encourage you to click on the link and go through the full resource guide. But if we can kind of maybe flip through the first couple pages, you can see in the table of contents, we have our initial greetings. Um, we're really trying to highlight and focus on our career and academic pathways. So really making this be part of one of a part of the guided pathways efforts, right? And thinking about those milestones within the guided pathways. 
in terms of what we're doing for entering students, the overview of the, the um, services, and then highlighting you know, on-campus resources such as the success centers, counseling, health and wellness, student life, bookstore, admissions record, financial aid, student services, um, and this other quick references. If we turn the page, um, I think one of the things that I'm really excited about too is we profile and highlight some of our esteemed faculty, staff, and administration that served in the armed forces. And so really kind of helping um, our veterans connect more, I think, in um, with our, our administrative faculty and staff um, team members. So you can see, I think in that first box, we're highlighting our director of student life and, and student conduct, Yvonne Watson as a veteran. And we have Cindy Baker, who is our um, director of finance and accounting. So um, that served. And so I think it's, it's a really nice um, touch in addition to highlighting our services and resources to really kind of put that spotlight on our veterans that um, who also serve us here at Long Beach City College. So um, if we can turn the page, you can see again, we really do a highlight of the actual veteran service office. So again, that idea of a one stop, right? And really making sure that our students um, recognize that they don't have to go from office to office to office. I think Dr. Baxter, that's one of her pet peeves. And she, when I was onboarded as a vice president, she spent a lot of time kind of helping me understand, you know, some of the, the experiences our students have and, and that idea of, you know, a one stop was very important. And so we made sure that we embedded that one stop model within veteran services, within the veteran services office so that things are co-located and students are not having to go from office to office to be served. So um, I'm gonna pause there because like I said, I would encourage the board or any member um, of the public who may be watching this to click on our link and, and download the full um, resource guide. Um, and I'll take any questions that you may have. Um, just again, in closing, just to offer some highlights because I know this is often as a question, we serve roughly about 300 veterans um, we certify over about 300 veterans each year, and that's who we serve um, through the center. So that's a, a, a very sizable, large number. Um, and you know, we're even with the current situation we're in in terms of the pandemic, um, our numbers are not too far off from last year. So even though we're in the midst of this pandemic, we're not seeing a sharp decline in the number of veterans that we're currently serving. So that kind of concludes my my brief update, and I'll take any questions if you have any. That was awesome. Awesome, Dr. Munoz. Yes, go ahead, Trustee Zia. Thank you. That was great. Um, uh, one of the questions um, that I have is, you know, we've heard from our senator and others that a lot of our veterans are um, at risk by a lot of the uh, for-profit institutions. Um, and they're essentially poaching students from community colleges. And I wanted to just un better understand, uh, do we have any form of education in the middle uh, so that their GI Bill doesn't get abused um, by these for-profit institutions and we provide support? I'm sorry, I think there's some background noise. But, um, <laughs> I hope that... I, uh, could be heard. Um, all right, perfect. Yeah, it's better now. Thank you, whoever put their mic on mute. Um, anyway, I, is there anything in the pamphlets or the resource guides that we provide to our students who are veterans that could make sure they're not being put at risk by some of these predatory um, institutions that may be targeting our students who are veterans? Um, that's one question I have. And a comment I have is that I, I'm really appreciative of how we, this the Veterans Center has been transformed. This has been a pet peeve for Trustee Baxter and I since we got on the board in 2014. Um, didn't even have a microwave, didn't even have um, a printer. It was just, you know, bubble gum and uh, <laughs> uh, rubber band uh, uh, financing. Um, so I really appreciate what, what has been done. Um, and then also if there is any way we can uh, expand on that and get the get the outreach and the information out to the students um, and staff that could kind of be the liaison between the two so we can get better support, further the support. Thank you, Trustee Zia. Um, I really appreciate your recommendation and comment about making sure that our veterans 
um, understand really the benefits of choosing us over, you know, a for-profit institution. So I think one of the things we could consider doing, and, and what's beautiful about these resource guides it's, and, and them being digital for that matter, is that you can constantly enhance them, right? And so one of the things that we can think about is really demonstrating very early on in the resource, what are the cost benefits? Here's what it costs to attend Long Beach City College. And this is all that we offer and then contrast that to some other institutions. You know, I don't know if we would want to explicitly call out for profits, but, you know, it would be very clear when you see those tables in comparison, you know, the benefit, right, and kind of why they should choose us. So if you're okay with that, I think that recommendation is very, it's well received and I can work with, um, and, I, and I do, oh, you know, I'd love to do my acknowledgements. I really want to acknowledge Stacy um, Toda, and she has been amazing, um, and Camille and that whole team, and Josh with, just getting these resource guides um, put together. And so we, I think we can definitely add, you know, something towards the front of that, that really highlights. And I, and I think that's a good point in terms of um, outreach. We have been increasing our outreach and we actually have received some grants and some different opportunities to partner, to reach out to veterans. And so we are actually sending staff um, out into the field to recruit um, veterans. So we are working towards that. Um, I think that's always an opportunity for growth, yes. Um, but I do want to assure you that we are being mindful of that as well. And then just again, I appreciate the acknowledgement. Um, it was a big pet peeve of mine too. You know, my first day here, I was I couldn't believe the condition of the Veteran Resource Center. And so we worked, and I need to acknowledge Vice President Drinkwine because truthfully, it was working through her area that provided the resources um, and facilities to be able to make the upgrades that we made. So it really was a team effort. So thank you. May I ask a question? Yes, of course. Yeah, Mike, um, I, I happened to be at the VA hospital uh, last Friday, not, not to be admitted. But anyway, um, what kind of outreach do we do at the hospital? I remember a long time ago, we actually had a group come from the hospital, there were, uh, this must have been right after the Vietnam War. I can't remember, Jerry, maybe you remember. But I mean, there were uh, guys there that were on gurneys, that they used a gurney like a wheelchair because they couldn't sit up and uh, toured our facilities and things like that. Uh, and I, maybe we have done that in the recent past, but I think anything that we can do to reach out uh, because as the guy said in the video, it's a real tough transition from the military, which is so structured, to come to Long Beach City College or any college and, and fit in. And so if, um, it's just a suggestion, uh, some kind of outreach to the VA hospital. I will make sure that um, when I do my check-in, so Dean um, Yvonne Gutierrez is the Dean over um, Enrollment Services. And so when I have my standing with her, I'll make sure I get more information about what outreach is happening and then really kind of direct her and the team to think about what they can do to partner with the VA. Mm -hmm. President Malaulu, I do have a question as well. Um, Absolutely, go right ahead. Um, so I do know a student that um, is a veteran, but he hasn't really used the veterans resources is there a, a way um that we can send this resource guide to all the students that registered as veterans mm -hmm. like in their application or could we email that th that to them so that they because when he told me that he didn't use the resources i asked him why he just said well i mean i don't think i really need it but i you know knowing enrique the person in the video um i knew like the the things that um, the benefits of uh, the veterans resources. So I kind of let him know about it, but I have a feeling that other students might, you know, want to sort of forget that side or that part of their life and just kind of like restart. So I just think it might be a great idea to just send that resource guide to those specific students so that they can say, oh, well, what's this? Let me look into it. And they have that right at their fingertips. So I think that would be a great idea if we could do that. Student trustee Jimenez, I love the idea. Um, I'm as I always do. I take extensive notes when I get feedback, and so I'm going to go ahead and work with our team to do a query of all of our veterans and do a really nice kind of uh, maybe from President Bynum can do a, a, maybe a, a letter, right? Because that's they they I know that they would probably love that, and then we can insert the link in and have that communication go out. So I'll work with Josh and the team to make sure that we do a targeted um, communication to our our, our veterans. 
with the link for the resource guide. And then once we're back on campus, very similar to the other resource guides, we will have some hard um, copies. And that's what's nice about having both the digital and then the hard copies, because some folks like me, I'm old school. I love to have something in my hand. I love to, I love the glossy pages. And so we'll have both available. Thank you. Trustee Malaulu, I failed to mention something. Um, and Chair Malaulu, may I? Yes, absolutely. Um, Mike, I, I forgot to mention, you know, um, Trustee Baxter and I have been working on this uh, since 2015, and a lot of our homeless students are, I should say a lot, but we have a representation uh, from the veteran body. And is there any way we can um, include information on the scholarships and the resources we have available for our veterans who may be experiencing housing insecurity and food insecurity and just flag it for them in the resource guide. That would be wonderful if we could do that um, and help destigmatize um, that for them. And as well as, you know, just there may be a sense of pride. So we want to be able to be a good support for those students who may not necessarily be that vocal about it. I, I think that's a great recommendation. And um, we'll, can it maybe even couple that with financial aid, resources, sure. um, and scholarship, and kind of just looking that so it doesn't single it out, that's but it's brilliant. there and edit. So we'll we'll do that in a way that, you know, that I think it's a great recommendation and I'll it's inclusive, guess, we'll right. bring that feedback forward. Perfect. And I'm sorry, I forgot something that Trustee Zia uh, triggered my memory. Um, there is in the foundation uh, an endowment to help the, the veterans office. Uh, a family, uh, probably 20 years ago, uh, in uh, honor of our veterans serving our country and keeping you and me and everybody safe, uh, they set up an endowment. So every year, interest should be generating. And so you might want to look at that. And I remember um, when I used to encourage veterans to apply for scholarships, they say, well, I have my benefits, save it for somebody else. But there are scholarships specifically for veterans. So um, I think it's important. I, I didn't look that carefully at your table of contents, but somehow there should be something in there. Excellent. Thank you. This is all really great feedback. And I'll work with Stacy and the team to incorporate some of these um, suggestions. I think those are all great suggestions. Dr. Munoz, you did a fantastic job. Um, I love the video and I would like to be able to share that video and I love the resource guide. Uh, thank you for following through with that. And I'm really happy with the work that's being done. Um, it's been a long time coming and I'm so glad that you spearheaded that, you and your team and the communications team that put together uh, the video and the guide. So thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. And I want to commend you. And if anybody at home is tuning in and you know a veteran, please reach out. Long Beach City College has for a very long time um, been active, especially with the 22 a day campaign that we've been hosting every year. Um, it, you know, I had my students write about that. So if we can prevent one veteran from feeling the loneliness or the desperation that they experience when they come back from deployment and, and no longer have family or support system there for them. Let Long Beach City College be the place where they could find that. So if you know, if you're aware of a veteran in the community, please reach out, please refer them to this, send them the link, just like um, Trustee Jimenez mentioned, reach out to them with this invitation and let them know. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay, if there's nothing additional on this item, then we're gonna move on. Uh, thank you, Dr. Munoz, you did a fantastic job. We're gonna move on to section 12 on the agenda, item 12.1, Academic Senate President. Good evening. I'm so pleased that the cultural curriculum audit was in the spotlight this evening. It deserves the recognition, recognition that it's getting on campus and from our co community college colleagues. These really intense conversations around equity started in the 15-16 academic year, Shauna Hagman was our uh, faculty co-chair of student equity, and we partnered together with faculty professional development and our spring flex days really worked in conjunction with the Center for Urban Education from USC, 
our speakers. Kathy mentioned early that that was all part of that going. So this has been, it's been building to this and it's exciting to see that now we have these deliverables. We, deliverables. we had to get talking about equity. We had to understand what that meant. We had to lay the foundation, which we've done in a really wonderful and specific and focused way. And now here we are um, again with the cultural curriculum on it. And I want to thank Jerome and I want to thank Wendy, both newer faculty, not brand new, but newer. I love to see them taking the leads on things for us. As you know, uh, professional development is a 10 plus one under Title V. It is the obligation of the Senate to provide that. And I think we're doing a really great service to all of our faculty, full-time, part-time, um, in the cultural curriculum audits. And now to be able to do it online, uh, being led by Michael Robertson, again, one of our newer faculty, it's just really exciting and I'm very proud of it. This continues to be a challenging time on campus in our community and throughout the nation. There are many LBCC heroes who deserve recognition and thanks to the facilities crews who are making sure that the campus is safe, clean and sanitized, not only for the essential personnel to be on campus, but our students who are returning to complete required lab portions of their spring classes and our faculty who are in the lab, in the lab classrooms. To the classified staff who continue to keep offices running, processing financial aid paperwork, assisting students register, and more often than not, they are the voice of the college when the phone rings. To the instructors full and adjunct who are putting the finishing touches on their online classes by completing the TOS training and the Canvas trainings. To the faculty team who are currently sharing their knowledge with those who are participating in the online curriculum audit over the next couple of weeks, to the superintendent president and the vice presidents who never miss an opportunity to note and applaud the amount of work being done this summer and truly value the time and effort of everyone rising to the challenge of a virtual world. And last but certainly not least, to our students who in spite of many obstacles, personal, professional, financial, educational, you inspire all of us, and it is our honor to serve every single one of you. As Luann Bynum reminds us weekly in all of our meetings, we are stronger together, all of us are Long Beach City College, and it will take all of us to meet this challenge. Finally, as a, the former Director of Alumni Development, and I won't tell you how many years ago that was at Long Beach City College, but I did have the distinct pleasure of being able to induct Dr. Bernie Luskin into the Long Beach City College Hall of Fame. He was and has remained one of the brightest stars in the Viking constellation. I thank him for his long devotion to Long Beach City College. He is always welcome on campus or until we can make that work. Uh, he's welcome at any Zoom we do. So uh, it's great to see him again. And I thank him for his efforts on behalf of the college and our students. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to the classified Senate, uh, section item 12.2. Hi. Um, as usual, Jerry Florence is a hard act to follow, and I ditto all she said about the heroic work that the entire campus community is doing. Um, and also, uh, Dr. Lux Luskin, I remembered hearing about you um, as a pioneer of televised instruction, which I worked on um, in the, when I first started in my position at the college. And we always heard about your pioneering efforts in um, California. Um, so the Classified Senate has continued to have great success with our community and connection uh, outreach events three times a week. On August 7th, we will be holding our annual retreat, which of course will be virtually. Um, and as uh, Wendy Koenig said earlier, nobody wants to go to a six hour Zoom session. So we are, we are foregoing our normal all day breakfast, lunch, um, fun time, and we're going to do four hours of Zoom session, but we're still going to have a fun time. We're going to be talking about a variety of topics that we normally don't have time to talk about. Um, we attended a virtual leadership conference uh, sponsored by our statewide organization, 4CS, the California, California Community College's Classified Senate, with some really great um, 
programs. Um, the keynote speaker was Eloy Ortiz Oakley. So, um, as usual, our focus is on participatory governance, which includes the upcoming accreditation, but we've also been concentrating on ways we can help our classified colleagues with the stresses and anxieties of what's going on in the world uh, right now, especially with helping them feel more connected. Um, we're trying to brainstorm more ideas on more things that we can do, but our efforts so far have been really successful. Just talking, even if it's in a Zoom session, has been about talking without a purpose, without a meeting, um, with just a theme or a topic, um, and have free willing discussion has been so helpful for so many people. Um, and we're looking forward to participating in the upcoming framework of reconciliation process that President Bynum mentioned earlier. Um, and you know, over the years, we've taken stabs at such things uh, with a variety of success or not success, but considering so much that has happened in the past few months, um, 180 days, I think President Bynum said, um, and especially what's happened recently, we anticipate really participating in an open, transparent, honest, and meaningful discussions as we move forward. I think the stage is set now more for people to just not worry about saying the wrong thing or, but having an, an open, honest, meaningful um, conversation like we have had um, in so many venues over the past, you know, six or so weeks. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're gonna move on to item 12.3, Board of Trustees reports. So I'll just go ahead and call Trustee Baxter. Do you have a report? Yeah, oh, of course I do. All right, here we go. I, I have to write it down so I don't forget. On uh, July 6th, I attended a Ronald McConnell House uh, meeting. Um, on July 13th, uh, we had our uh, monthly homeless meeting. And this uh, homeless committee is made up of community people, classified staff, faculty, and community volunteers and college retirees. And we had a whole discussion. We are to have a, uh, a fundraiser on um, September 13th. And I, in um, May, I attended a Zoom fundraiser and I brought up the idea of having, so having our fundraiser virtually. And I'm hoping uh, that we'll get more participation from the people on campus and people in the community because they won't have to leave home. Uh, we're, what we're gonna do is um, charge like $10 uh, so that you get invited to the, uh, to the uh, meeting. We're gonna have student testimonials. We're gonna have prizes. We're gonna have entertainment. If there's anybody on the staff, uh, I, I already volunteered Annie Engel and I haven't even talked to her about singing. So if somebody, we could do, we could do a faculty frolics, faculty and staff frolics. And only Jerry knows, well, Luann, you might know about that too. So, I mean, so we're going to entertain people and we're going to have a lot of fun. So uh, put that on your calendar, three o'clock on um, September 13th. Um, uh, then um, on September, uh, September, July 15th, um, I spoke uh, to Mary Thoitz's class at the Senior Center. And um, what Mary has done the last two summers is had a free class just to keep the seniors involved. But this year, of course, it was on Zoom. So uh, only obnoxious me would volunteer to give one of the classes. And so I was the last class before it was uh, uh, recessed for the summer. And I gave a talk on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, the Women's Suffrage Amendment. And so if anybody out there is looking for something to do on Saturday, August 1st, it's a repeat for American Association of University Women, 10 o'clock, it's free. So all those out there, I know you want to sign up and you can send me an email or a text and I'll show you how to do it. Um, so uh, it, what was so interesting is the actual talk, because I, I learned a long time ago, nobody wants to listen to somebody for an hour and a half. 
I spoke for 50 minutes and then the rest of the time we had discussion. And it was so interesting to hear from the seniors and their points of view about women, about Hillary Clinton. We had a fascinating discussion about that, uh, about what's going on in the world uh, and um, how the struggles today have, have gone on through all different groups all throughout our history. Anyway, it was a great discussion. And I would suggest to you next fall the sign up for Mary's class, because again, it will be on Zoom. And every week there's a different topic. And um, Craig Hendricks, a retired history professor, uh, is uh, co teaching it with Mary. And uh, maybe I'll get asked to come back. Uh, then on July 16th, I attended a CCLC webinar. Black Lives Matter in Education. And this was a wonderful presentation by African-American uh, Board of Trustees members, college presidents, um, uh, a, a Latino trustee. Uh, and um, they discussed about how we can increase the number of uh, African-American em uh, employees, faculty, classified people. It was very well done and outstanding. I was glad I listened to that. Then on the 17th, um, I belong to another group called Women Warriors, and these are women veterans. And they did a um, documentary on the six triple eight uh, Women's uh, Army Corps Battalion. And these were African-American women who served in World War II. Uh, they, there were 800 of them. And they were so cute in their uniforms and they were so proud. And uh, they were sent to Birmingham, England. First of all, they talked about the struggles in the United States and the struggles they also had in England, by the way. And what their job was, was sorting the mail. And there was two years worth of mail that had never been sorted and sent out. And one of the people who talked was a senator whose parents had communicated World War, during World War II. And if it hadn't been for these women going through all these oh, you get mailbags after mailbags of mail, and they sorted it and got it to the right soldier. Uh, and then they got the right soldier's mail to the right person back at home. Oh, it was a fabulous documentary. And I'm sure if you went to womenwarriors.com, um, you could find it online, but it was very, very, very well done. Uh, and then um, lastly, I want to say congratulations to Sunny Zia on her appointment uh, from uh, the Board of Supervisors. And I, I said at the beginning, uh, no retiree had, had uh, died this month, but we do want to especially recognize Congressman John Lewis. And there was an excellent um, uh, biography of him on PBS uh, this week. And all he did in his 30 plus years uh, as serving as a congressman. That's the end of my report. Thank you very much, Trustee Baxter. Trustee Otto, do you have a report? Um, just, just very briefly, um, you know, I've been uh, very interested in what uh, the response of the college and the unified school district is going to be to the uh, framework for reconciliation. Affiliation, and I've been watching that and seeing how it was. I'm, I'm talking to President Bynum about it, and uh, I'm encouraged by our uh, uh, potential work with CCEJ, and I'm trying to stay on top of that and um, uh, and want to participate in that. Um, I uh, was very encouraged today by the work that was done by Dr. Bernie Luskin uh, with the board. And uh, as uh, Sunny Zia says, uh, let's see what happens and uh, let's see what actions uh, are, 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 are taken. I think it's uh, we're off to a good start uh, on that. Uh, I'm also looking forward to uh, college day uh, that's coming up. Um, and uh, um, I want to know, I, I'm, I've made some inquiries as to how that's going to be done and, and how we as uh, trustees can participate in that. The um, uh, I'll just say one thing about um, uh, Representative Lewis. Um, I actually knew Representative Lewis um, not well, but uh, in 
a long time ago uh, I, when I, I worked for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Washington, D.C., when they did the March on Washington, and he was there and very involved in that. And uh, he was a presence then as he was a presence for the rest of his life. And uh, um, I was saddened uh, by his passing, uh, but uh, uh, we we all have our time. And uh, he's done he did wonderful things for uh, his uh, his folks and for the United States. That's the end of my report. Thank you, Trustee Otto. Uh, Trustee Zia, do you have a report? I'd like to go last, Chair Malaulu. Okay, you can go after Trustee Untuck. Trustee Untuck, do you have a report? Uh, yeah, I can go next. Uh, thank you so much. Um, just want to, um, you know, busy time. You know, ironically, during the coronavirus, it seems like uh, all day, every day, every hour is booked <laughs> for more than night. They were busier now than, than before. Uh, and and uh, so I, I've done tried to do my fair share of uh, staying involved and uh, engaged in activity. So sure. A few items. First, I just want to say kudos uh, to Dr. Scott and um, Melissa Infusio on the cannabis uh, workforce training program. Um, you know, I, you know, a number of articles were out uh, to rave reviews, uh, very positive feedback. I think we were on ABC uh, Channel 7 even covered it. Ironically, uh, ironically, they talked about cannabis might be a solution for COVID-19. <laughs> I thought that was uh, quite an interesting uh, editorial uh, comment by ABC7, but you know, was not in our press release, but, <laughs> you know, uh, they picked that up. So it was uh, interesting that, that, you know, there's a lot of discussion about and uh, what we're doing and, and, and in this moment in time, uh, doing things differently. And, you know, this has been a program, I want to say probably 18 months, uh, we've been quietly working on and looking at legal options and working with the trade association and the city to end development and it's um you know this is one of those programs that formerly you know systemic racism negatively impacted black and brown communities disproportionate even so even though the research shows that uh, people of all the cities uh, consume marijuana at the same rate <laughs> no matter what your skin tone uh people consume marijuana <laughs> and uh so it's good that you know there's a expungement workshops there's uh new job opportunities these are all good paying jobs with healthcare environment, you know, their, their union jobs. And so uh, it's good to have the partnership, both from the uh, state level with the uh, Cannabis Advisory Committee giving input. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's really innovative. We're, you know, first to market. And it's, uh, we have local employment opportunities of the different, different dispensaries, laboratories, distribution. It's really uh, not every day that you get a new economy pop up and a new new uh, job opportunities like we have uh, in the newly legalized recreational and medical uh, cannabis industry. So just thanks again for every, you know, workforce development, Dr. Scott, academic folks, legal folks that all worked on helping make that happen. That, that was a big, a big win for all of us. Um, want to say, you know, uh, today I was a speaker for Long Beach State. Uh, a number of us are 49ers. Uh, they had me as the alumni speaker on uh, energy and environmental um, uh, careers in the public sector. Talked all about, uh, you know, getting on a job list and the merit system. And, you know, sometimes you have to have your professional engineering license and uh, or years of experience to even apply. And so I uh, shared a little bit about my my career trajectory and then also, you know, talked about working for the city of Long Beach, uh, city colleges, personnel commission and, uh, different requirements for the state in different capacities. So a nice kind of lunch hour with about 30 uh, students virtually in a, in a Zoom call today with the uh, Long Beach State Alumni Association. You know, talking about the framework for reconciliation, again, thank my colleagues. Uh, we are really uh, pioneers in this and at least our local educational uh, systems that we, you know, early adopters, again, I was in to the Long Beach Unified School Board meeting this Monday to talk about what are we doing, why are we doing it, because uh, they have not adopted it at the school board yet. They're considering it, and hopefully they don't have to wait until uh, Trustee Otto gets on the board, and they can do it sooner than that, but they're thinking about it over there, and uh, had an opportunity 
opportunity to, with other African American leaders, uh, address the board on the agenda. Uh, you know, to talk about yes, you know, forty five percent of Long Beach Unified students who go to college come to Long Beach City College. You know, the majority of Black students in higher education are at our institution and not at Long Beach State. And that uh, there are things that we you know, shared what we're already doing about the anti-bias anti syllabi, you know, about the implicit bias training that, you know, we've, we, we've done a lot of work. We recognize the school district has done a lot of work, uh, particularly the, Dr. Felton Williams has done a lot of work. But we also have to recognize that everything we've done is not enough. It is still not enough. We have not reached the mountaintop. We still have work to do. It's not about blaming, shaming, or judging anybody. It's about fixing the system so that our educational outcomes are improved, that we have respect in the workplace, we have dignity in our work. This is what it's the ultimate outcome. And so I was able to share that briefly with the school board this Monday, and uh, they seem to be receptive and you know, appreciated, uh, um, you know, Dr. Felton Williams, Dr. Uh, Juan Benito. As uh, board member Megan Kerr, you know, working together with them uh, to share, you know, our perspective, share our resolution with them, you know, and, and talk about working with CCEJ, trying to bring some the USC Center for Race and Equity, um, you know, that, that there's professional resources. This is not, you know, we have a lot of the answers. We know the problems, and you know, now it's just doing solutions. Uh, and so that was a very positive thing uh, this week uh, at, at the school board. Did have a chance to talk to um, Superintendent President Bynum about the uh, ad hoc committees, both on reimagining public safety and collecting data. So um, trying to see what other uh, districts are doing, uh, what are all of our options, what, what is actually our total spend? Because even though we talked about the Long Beach PD contracts, the value, that doesn't actually ca capture what we're invoiced or overtime or other security contracts, we have a staff pro or other security agency. So we, we have uh, a lot to consider. Um, you know, and the goal here, again, is not to make us more unsafe uh, or to put anyone at risk, uh, but it's really a, is the um, contracts and the way that we're thinking about public safety the right size for the campus today and for the community. You know, I, I, again, I, I don't think we should be paying for SWAT teams. We should not be paying for helicopters. We shouldn't be paying for armed escorts to your car uh, or to, you know, paying extra costs to uh, uh, take bicycles off campus. You know, that's the fully loaded, you know, cost of an armed officer. It really raises the question, is it, um, is that really the best use of taxpayer money? And uh, some re areas, yes. In some areas, no. But it's a joint effort. And uh, thank um, Superintendent Bryden for, uh, or President Bryden for bringing, uh, getting that data together so we can have a, a robust conversation and a future board presentation before we make any decisions. Um, lastly, uh, we've been doing a lot of education. I spent a great 99 cents. I keep saying the best 99 cents of my life. Uh, on Amazon Prime, I watched the uh, Pieces I Am. It's a documentary about Toni Morrison, uh, just a literary giant. I, you know, I, I know I knew of her. I know she was an author. But, man, to uh, see the life that she lived and the, the battle for justice in so many different areas, to get her long overdue you know, Pulitzer Prize and Nobel Prize and just an American treasure that, you know, unfortunately passed away last year, but really speaks to, you know, the, it was so apropos to the time we're in today that, the, the, you know, the documentary wasn't, was, you know, three, four years ago, but it just, you know, everything we've talked about, everything of injustice and, and structural deficiencies and inadequacy and uh, inequality, was, it was lived in her life. So I, I just, um, really, you know, we're all doing, I think, our own education in our own different ways. For, uh, and, and it just was a powerful um, uh, documentary. So if you get a chance to get on Amazon Prime, it's the best 99 cents. Uh, I recommend you spend it in two hours of your life. That'll be worth it. Uh, last and closing, you know, Congressman John Lewis, you know, another giant, you know, drum major for justice. Uh, I, I had a chance to meet him three or four times uh, in my life. I'm a I mean, I've shared I'm a Congressional Black Caucus uh, uh, alumni of their leadership training program and had the chance to spend some time with him in D.C. and have seen him at conferences and conventions over the years and always was just a welcoming, jovial, you know, treated you with respect, gave you his attention, would tell his stories to you, you know, 
amazing human being and, uh, you know, tremendous loss for the country. And, you know, really uh, I join in the calls to end today's uh, meeting in honor of Congressman John Lewis. It's just uh, he's done so much for so many that, you know, many times we don't know the history, you just take it for granted. But he literally got beat over the head, you know, for our freedoms. And so, um, you know, just want to recognize him and, and uh, celebrate his life uh, when we close the meeting tonight. That's all I have for my report. Thank you, Trustee Anta. Trustee Zia. Thank you. I, um, there's just so much, uh, but I'm going to try to be brief. And I appreciate um, uh, Chair Malulu for taking my suggestion to adjourn the meeting tonight in honor of Congressman Lewis. Um, I too believe, and uh, it's just a great loss. Um, and it's just, it, it was really sad. It was really sad. And, um, but this is, uh, uh, hopefully he'll be immortal in our thoughts with the work that he's done. Um, and um, I want, wanted to thank uh, Trustee Baxter and the uh, Interim Superintendent President Bynum um, for your kind words. Um, yes, uh, the, the Board of Supervisors on July 7th um, appointed me on the Los Angeles uh, Probation Commission. Um, this is uh, really in connection with the juvenile facilities and making sure that it's um, uh, humane. Um, and uh, I'm particularly uh, thrilled about the education piece and the opportunities for the youth that um, uh, come out of the custody and uh, having some sort of a connection to our college because we have some such great programs. Um, and they're really excited that I'm on the commission. Hopefully I can um, serve it well and really give uh, more exposure to our district, our college district and the great work that we do with our justice scholars program for our formerly incarcerated youth. And then also the job training programs that we have and um, the connection to industry. Um, I was blessed to lead that effort with College Promise 2.0, the industry partnership, our Maritime Center for Excellence, um, as well as bringing on um, our first um, industry partner, the Port of Long Beach. And uh, right now we're at 149 industry partners that could be a pathway for these youth and young adults to have a, a pipeline to good careers and be able to enroll in our programs. It'll help our FDEs. Um, it'll also, it's a win-win situation and um, also get into vocational programs, which is a um, natural fit for a lot of these um, students. Um, I refer to them as students. Uh, I don't like uh, the word inmate. Um, it it's, uh, doesn't uh, humanize the situation and I would love to have them go from inmate to student um, and use our college as a pathway to their success and prosperity. Um, so I look forward to serving the county and representing our district um, and representing it well and finding pathways for um, supporting our posterity and our youth in the future and having Long Beach City College be the leader in that um, uh, regard. So, um, and speaking of documentaries and uh, recommendations, I want to recommend to you, I know I've spoken um, in the past in January, I believe I spoke about this, the Bard Prison Institute and College Behind Bars. New York Times has covered um, this uh, quite extensively, um, but it's just really inspiring. Uh, and I, re I really relish in the idea of seeing folks in the prison system getting a great education and having a pathway for hope. A lot of these students are in uh, participating in debate teams, debating against um, students in Columbia uh, and NYU, and they're really succeeding and um, uh, thriving. So it is possible. Um, the recent article that was covered for, by the New York Times was a Yale graduate um, and I think the headline was, can a prisoner be <laughs> a law student and a graduate? And um, the, the student, was, the, the graduate was essentially being, it passed the bar exam, but they wouldn't um, give him his license. And it's a really, really um, 
incredible story. I, I recommend um, us really taking a look at that. We have a lot of our um, uh, disadvantaged community that are just this mass incarceration. We have to do something about it in a loving way and re reduce uh, recidivism um, and support our population that is uh, that really needs that love and support and the pathway that we provide as an educational institute. So the documentary, the recommendation is called, it's College Behind Bars, and it's being offered on Netflix. Um, if you really want to get inspired, watch it. PBS also offered it, but um, that's what I want to leave you with, and, and that's all I have. And thank you again for the love and acknowledgement and recognition. Thank you. Um, for my report, I just want to share with you that um, I did have the meeting that all the board members had with uh, Dr. Leskin on July 6th. And then on July 8th, Trustee Untuck and I were a part of a meeting that uh, Mayor Robert Garcia hosted to sort of reimagine the college promise to include the framework for reconciliation and to truly be sensitive to Black Lives Matter, as well as some of the other social justice issues that are happening in our community. So I'm very excited for the work that's ahead. And I'm also very excited for the opportunity that LBCC has to be in the forefront of that and to be a part of that discussion. This past Friday, This past Friday, I was at um, LBCC um, for the food bank that was hosted by um, LA County Supervisor Janice, um, the LA County Federation of Labor, as well as lots of representatives from uh, the labor community, lots of volunteers. And it was so heartwarming to be a part of that. We were there on Friday morning and there were over 150 volunteers. Um, when we started, we started right at nine, but we were there at about 7.30. Um, the line was to the traffic circle. The line of cars went all the way down to the traffic circle. And I'm so proud that that event took place at uh, the Pacific Coast campus because I'm, I'm getting a little tearful thinking about it because there were so many people in that immediate community who were walking up, who don't have cars. There were um, a lot of elderly residents in the community who had baskets or wheels or baby strollers who were coming from the apartment building on the other side of Orange. And it was really heartwarming to be a part of that and to witness uh, not, not only the, the generosity that was displayed, I, I believe the number was 4,000 families that were gifted uh, food boxes, two boxes each, assorted groceries, but just the kindness that was demonstrated. We also uh, donated diapers and baby wipes to members in the community, and we also um, had opportunities and resources available for them. So I'm just really proud that LBCC was able to host that event. Um, there was no fiscal impact to the college. Um, other than offering the facility and the city of Long Beach um, was the uh, point to coordinate it. And I'm just very grateful for that. Dr. Munoz was also very instrumental in helping us make that happen as far as reaching out to student services. Um, other than that, um, I know that several of my colleagues recommended some documentaries. I'm a documentary fanatic myself. I've seen the Tony Morrison and the Congressman uh, Lewis documentaries. There's a couple actually. And uh, I'm just, you know, for anybody in the public who is sleeping at this time, you are really missing out on a turning point in history. And this time period, not only because of COVID, but through COVID is really gonna be documented. So as I close my trustee report, I just wanna end with that with a little word of encouragement um, to make sure that you do a little introspection and make sure that you're on the right side of history. Because uh, what we've learned in the past few months, uh, maybe even longer, it just wasn't uh, highlighted in the press as much, 
but what we've learned is that the history that we were taught was not accurate. And uh, I'm afraid that, that we are going to be the subjects of history that our future generations will be studying. So make sure you're on the right side of history with this. So that concludes my trustee report. I'm really excited because it appears as if uh, we're going to set a record with a short meeting tonight. I'm really happy for that. Um, we're going to move on to section 12.4. Do we have any trustee committee reports? All right, hearing none, we're going to move on to 12.5. Do we have any future reports? Okay, and now uh, we're going on to section 13 on the agenda. Madam Secretary, do we have any public comments on non-agenda items? No, there aren't any requests. Okay, so we are going, um, there will be no second closed session, uh, section 14. So now we're gonna move on to section 15, which is the adjournment. And uh, I just wanna make sure that the, the time is right. Is that accurate? It says 8.36 on the time, Madam Secretary. 8.36. All right, time. so we are adjourning until the next regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Trustees. It will be held on Wednesday, August 26, 2020. If we're unable to meet in person at the Liberal Arts Campus, then we will be meeting again via Zoom. Thank you, everyone. I wish you all uh, good health and safety. And um, as my colleagues have said, we adjourn this meeting in the memory of Congressman John Lewis for all of his service. Thank you so much, everyone. Be safe and take care. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.